Good morning. I'm David Reese, Chair of the New York City Rent Guidelines Board, and I'd like to welcome you to this virtual meeting of the board. This is the second meeting in a series of public meetings and hearings to determine renewal lease adjustments for rent stabilized housing units in New York City with leases commencing or being renewed on or after October 1st, 2021 and on or before September 30th, 2022. The conclusion of the Chauvin trial this week has heightened the raw emotions that swept across the country almost a year ago when George Floyd was brutally murdered by a police officer in full view of ordinary citizens. Members of this board and many of you who attend and watch our meetings were affected by this crime and all of the crimes just like it. It was part of our discussions as board members. It was part of the testimony at our hearings. I know that the same will be true this year as well. And I want to acknowledge this and to acknowledge how difficult it is to go about business as usual if we even can. Just yesterday, George Floyd's brother wrote, this is what justice feels like. Gut-wrenching relief, exhaustion, it's not sweet or satisfying. It's necessary, important, maybe even historic, but only with the passage of time will we know if the guilty verdict in the trial of Derek Chauvin is the start of something that will truly change America and the experience of black Americans. Given the work we do on this board, I also think it's important to acknowledge how systemic racism extends beyond our criminal justice system, how it is woven into all of our systems, including housing, how it impacts the experience of black Americans in so many ways. For the last hundred years, African-Americans have suffered from discriminatory government policies, from segregated housing, to redlining, to racially restrictive covenants, to exclusionary zoning, and before that, they suffered from far worse. As we do our work on this board this year, let us recommit to the fundamentals of a just democracy that form the basis of our work here. With that, I will now take roll call so we can begin to deliberate on the important topic that has been entrusted to us. Please respond if present. Christina DeRose. Present. Shayla Garcia. Present. Christiane Gonzalez Rivera. Present. Leah Goodridge. Present. Cecilia Hossa. Cecilia? Cecilia. Present. Scott Walsh. Sorry. Scott is not present. David Reese present. Currently, there is an owner member vacancy on the board. I'm present too. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Alex. Did I, I jumped you? Sorry. Sorry about that. Alex is here as well. Currently, there is an owner member vacancy on the board. City Hall is aware of the vacancy, and we hope to have a new owner member in place for our next meeting. Our next virtual meeting will be April 29th, starting at 9.30 a.m. The board will hear testimony from speakers who have been invited by the tenant and owner members of the board. Speakers represent tenants will be heard from 9.30 a.m. to noon, and we'll hear from speakers representing owners from 1 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Information on how to attend this meeting will be posted on our website, nyc.gov RGB, in our meeting section at least 72 hours prior to the meeting. If you are interested in receiving email updates about upcoming RGB meetings and hearings, please go to our homepage and click on the RGB email updates under quick links. The preliminary vote for rent stabilized renewal lease adjustments is currently scheduled for May 5th. This will be a virtual meeting. Information to attend this meeting will be made available in the near future. Today, staff will present the 2021 price index of operating costs and the 2021 mortgage survey report. Both of these reports will be posted on our website after the meeting, as well as the slides from the staff presentations. Just click research on our homepage, nyc.gov RGB to download these documents. After the presentation of the reports, we will have four guest speakers with us today. Rafael Sestero, President and CEO, Community Preservation Corporation. Mike Edelman, Group Vice Chair, m and Realty Capital Corporation. Lucy Jaffe, Assistant Commissioner from HBD and Woody Pascal, Deputy Commissioner from HCR. Please note board members that the annual filing of the Conflicts of Interest Board Financial Disclosure Report 2021 filing period will be from May 10 through June 4. We will mail the pocket packets to each board member next week. I will now introduce our Executive Director, Andrew McLaughlin, who will be presenting the 2021 Price Index of Operating Costs. Andrew? Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna just quickly go in and show everyone how to sign up for our emails that I wanna make sure that people can do that. So I'm gonna quickly share my uh, screen here to do that. So here's our website, our homepage at nyc.gov backslash RGB. We'll get you there. 
So if you go to Quick Links uh, email updates, you'll come to an email updates page and to sign up for, it's called a newsletter. You click on there, brings you to the nyc.gov site and email and at least your email and zip code is what's needed. And you submit that and you'll be getting our, our information um, about our meetings and anything that we send out. Um, the meetings for the rest of the schedule have been posted as well. So if you go to meetings, uh, 2021 meetings, you'll see that the rest of our schedule, today's meeting is April 22nd. We have the 29th, but we have all our meetings now going through to our final vote. So there they are. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear. Um, and now I will jump into a presentation. Just give me one second. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, great. So I'll be presenting the uh, 2020 price index of operating costs this morning. Um, and our price index gathers prices for our market basket of goods and services used in the operation and maintenance of buildings that contain rent stabilized units in New York City and uses these prices to estimate cost price changes from one year to the next. Changes in the overall PIOC result from changes in the prices of individual goods and services, each weighted by its relative importance as a percentage of total operating and maintenance expenditures. This is the same approach used by the Consumer Price Index and other similar indices, but the PIOC specifically analyzes the goods and services typically purchased by owners of buildings containing rent stabilized units. Separate indices are are also calculated for rent stabilized hotels and lofts. The 2020 price index of operating costs published in April of 2021 focuses on data from April 2020 to March 2021. It does reflect the impact of the current health crisis on expense data for owners of rent stabilized apartments in New York City during this 12 month period. Here's an overview of the changes in the apartment price index, which we will go into detail shortly. Notably, insurance costs rose 18.8%, the largest proportional increase in this year's price index. And taxes, which account for nearly 33% of the price index increased by 3.9%. Decreases were seen in fuel and administrative costs, declining 3.3% and 0.7% respectively. Increases were seen in the remaining three components with maintenance rising 3.1%, labor costs 2.8% and utilities 2.1%. These changes in costs result in a total increase of 3%. By comparison, the CPI increased just 1.5% over this same time period. So the PIOC is made up of cost weights and price relatives. So we identify prices for various items that are representative of operating costs for apartment buildings in New York City. The importance of each of these items is calculating uh, the PIOC is its weight this should be based on how much owners have spent in the past for that particular category of expenses. For instance, in this year's price index, about 33% of all costs are real estate taxes. The change in price of, of or costs is referred to as our price relative. So as I just go through our presentation, I talk about weights and price relatives. Those are the things that we are, um, that make up the price index.
The real estate tax component of the price index is the largest component and in fact represents almost 33% of owner's costs. This year, taxes rose 3.9%, driven largely by the rise in assessments. This slide shows a breakdown of the change of assessments, tax rate, and exemptions by borough. Assessed valuations of properties containing rent-stabilized units rose by 6.9% in fiscal 2021. Assessments rose in all five boroughs, with Brooklyn witnessing the highest growth at 10.5%, followed by the Bronx at 10%, Staten Island at 8.6%, Queens at 6.5%, and Manhattan 5.7%. But it's important to note that buildings in Manhattan account for much of the change in asset values citywide. This was true in fiscal 2021 with 59% of the total assessed value attributed to this borough. The large majority of buildings that contain rent stably the rent stabilized units are in tax class two. There was a decrease in the class two tax rate of 1.6% from fiscal 2020 to fiscal 2021, falling in each of the five boroughs. At the same time, exemptions lowered the overall tax burden by 1.4%. So as a result, the rise in assessments was offset by a rise in the total value of exemptions and a decrease in the tax rate which had the effect of lowering the total rise in taxes. Again, overall increase, resulting in an overall increase of, in, of taxes of 3.9%. Andrew, Andrew, uh, are the weights, be, the weights that we're using here, are they, do they remain the same every year or do they change? We update the weights using um, data from the RPIE uh, filings. So we'll take those, those um, and adjust them on a yearly basis. So the weights that are being used in this price index are the most current that we can gather and they're from the um, RPI filings from 2019. So they're very current. They're as current mm -hmm. as they can be. Okay. As you see on this graph, you can disaggregate the taxes into several components. The black line in the chart represents the change in taxes from one year to the next. That's this line right here. This year, the change was 3.9%. The change can be broken down into the impact of assessments, which is, are the orange bars, and the impact of exemptions, abatements, and changes in tax rate, which are grouped together in the maroon bar. The change in taxes were primarily due to a rise in assessments of 6.9%. Exemptions lowered the overall rise in taxes as did the lowering of the tax rate, which should be represented in this bar. It is interesting to note that since 2003, the increase in real estate taxes have more often than not been driven by the rise in assessments. And since 2011, almost entirely by assessments. The price Index measure of labor costs includes union and non-union salaries and benefits, in addition to social security and unemployment insurance. The cost of non-union labor makes up more than half of the labor component. The entire labor cost component comprises 11.1% of the overall price index. Labor costs rose 2.8%. The rise in labor costs was primarily due to increases in non-union wages, as well as rising costs in healthcare. An increase in unemployment insurance of 6.2% had minimal impact since it accounts for only 1% of this component's weight. Wages comprise 80% of the labor cost component. Non-union pay increased by 2.2% while unionized wages also rose, rising by 3.9%. Health and welfare benefits, which comprises almost 14% of the labor cost component increased 3.8%. Following a supplement to the owner survey in 2020 that asked owners for detailed information on their labor costs, the weights of the labor cost component were redistributed in 2021. There was a shift in wages from union to non-union labor and the weight of health and welfare benefits dropped by more than nine percentage points.
The fuel component comprises 7.3% of this year's price index. The change in cost measured in this component considers both the change in weather and the change in prices for heating multifamily buildings by fuel oil, natural gas, and steam. This year, the fuel component decreased 3.3%. The cost for heating buildings by gas makes up almost half of this co component. Gas costs increased 8.5%. Fuel oil costs, which account for 46% of this component, fell decreasing 16.1%. And steam costs rose 2.4%, but these costs only account for roughly 7% of the fuel component. The utilities component consists of non-heating natural gas and electricity costs, as well as water and sewer charges and make up about 10% of this year's PIOC. This year, utilities increased 2.1%. Non-heating electricity costs, which account for over a quarter of the weight in the component, increased by 7.8%. While non-heating gas co costs, which account for less than 2% of the utilities component, fell 1%. And the growth in this component was dampened by a 0% increase in the water and sewer rate. This item accounts for over 72% of the utilities component. The maintenance component includes painting and other services performed by contractors, hardware and cleaning items such as buckets and pine disinfectant, and appliances that need periodic replacement such as refrigerators and stoves. This component accounts for about 20% of this year's price index. This year, maintenance increased 3.1%. Of the 29 expense items contained in this component, just four items accounted for half of its expenditure weight. This year, painters' rates rose 3.7%. The combination of the two plumbing items increased 2.9%, and electrician services rose 2.3%. Other price in increases of note were boiler repairs going up 2.5%, floor maintenance uh, remained flat, roof repair increased 5.3%, and extermination services um, rose to, uh, was a 0% increase. And these seven items, total of seven items are contained in these, um, and they account for about a quarter of this component. Fees paid to management companies, accountants, and attorneys make up 87% of the administrative cost component, which fell by 0.7%. Management fees decreased 5.1%, uh, and they comprise about half of this component. Accounting fees increased in this year's price index of 1%, and attorney fees rose 5.3% and they account for about 36% of the administrative component. And communications, which accounts for less than 5% of this component increased 2.2%. For the 10th consecutive year, there was an increase in the insurance cost component rising 18.8%. Insurance costs account for 5.6% of the price index. Changes in insurance costs for owners vary by the amount of the policy. Policies that co cost more than $6,451, uh, which represent half of all verified insurance quotes, saw an increase in costs of 20.9% upon renewal. Meanwhile, buildings with policies of $6,451 or less saw an increase of 3.5%. Andrew, I just have a question about the insurance. Sure. So even though both the two types of policies both went up overall, it only went up, insurance only went up overall 18%. I'm just trying to understand how if, you know, policies, certain policies went up 20% and others went up three and a half percent. Is that sort of like when you put those two together and I guess weight them, the insurance right. all raised 18%? So, so when we gather the information, we're gathering actual um, insurance costs of a policy. Mm -hmm. So the more the policy, the more it's going to add to the overall cost. So this year in particular, we found that 
um, larger buildings and, and the cutoff, the median was $640, $451. So um, insurance policies higher than that there was a much larger increase and, the, and those are the larger buildings. So you may have a policy that may be, you know, $45,000, um, which had a large increase. And that's gonna have much more of an impact than say a policy that's $3,500 for a year for a small building um, that had a, you know, was averaging a three and a half percent increase. So if you total up the entire cost, you're gonna find that it's not the total number of buildings, but it's the total number or total value of all those policies together. So the bigger policies have a bigger impact right, okay. on, on the change of that relative. And in this particular year, those large buildings saw these large, large increases. So that's why we saw such a, such a large um, increase from last year. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, that does. Okay. So in 1983, an expenditure study provided a basis for calculating separate sets of expenditure weights for different types of buildings that contain rent stabilized units. So in addition to the price index of all rent stabilized apartments, the PIOC includes separate indices for buildings constructed before 1947, which we refer to as pre-1947, and for, excuse me, buildings constructed in 1947 or later, which we refer to as post-46 as well as for gas heated and oil heated buildings. This year, total costs in pre-47 index rose by 3.1%, while costs in the post-1946 post index rose by a lesser amount of 2.7%. Indices were also calculated for gas heated and oil heated. Gas heated um, costs went up, uh, buildings heated by gas went up by 3.8%, and oil, buildings heated by oil went up 1.6%. In addition to the apartment indices, the 2020 PIOC report also includes indices for hotels loss, the core um, PIOC and a projected all rent stabilized apartment index for 2022. The price index for all hotels increased 1.9% this year. Uh, this year, there were increases in all of the PIOC hotel components except fuel and administrative costs. The fuel component decreased 4.4%. Uh, the fuel component accounts for just over 14% of the entire in hotel index. Um, administrative cost component also fell by 1.8%. The insurance component rose by the greatest proportion, increasing 18.8%. The remaining four component witnessed more moderate cost increases with taxes rising 2.4%, maintenance 2.7%, labor costs 2.2%, and utilities 1.9%. The hotel pricing just also includes separate indices for each of three categories of hotels that contain rent stabilized units, as well as the general index for all hotels. The three categories of hotels are traditional hotel, a multiple dwelling that has amenities such as a front desk, maid, or linen services. Rooming houses, a multiple dwelling other than a hotel with 30 or fewer sleeping rooms. And single room occupancy hotels, or SROs, a multiple dwelling in which one or two persons reside separately and independently of other occupants in a single room. Among the different categories of hotels, the index for traditional hotels increased 1.7%. Rooming houses by 2% and SROs by 2.6%. The increase in the loft index this year was 5.1%, less than the increase that was seen in 6 point, of 6.2% 6 in 2020. Increases in costs were seen in all eight components that make up this index, with the exception again of fuel and administrative costs. Other, fuel decrease falling 13.3%, and administrative costs, other, fell 4%. All other components increased, including insurance costs, administrative costs, legal, taxes, maintenance, and labor costs, and utilities. The core PIC rose 3.5% in 2021. 
This index measures long-term trends by factoring out shifts in fuel costs for heating buildings that contain rent-stabilized units. The rise in the 2020 core PIOC was 0.5 percentage points higher than this year's apartment index. That was 3% and 1.6% points lower than last year's core of 5.1%. The core PIOC rose at a faster pace than the overall PIOC because of fuel costs, which were not used to calculate the core PIOC actually decreased by 3.3%. Overall, the PIC is expected to grow 1.3% from 2021 to 2022. Costs are predicted to rise in each component except taxes, with the largest growth, 13.6%, projected to be in insurance. Other projected increases include fuel, 7.8%, maintenance of 3.9%, labor costs, 3.7%, admin costs, 2.1%, and utilities, 1.6%. Taxes, the component that carries the most weight in this index is projected to decrease 5%. The total on this page shows projected changes in PIC components for 2022. The core PIC is projected to rise 0.8%. It, it is important to note that changes in costs and prices after March, 2021, the last month covered by this study will be measured in next year's price index. So that leads us to the commensurate rent adjustments. Each year, the board is obligated to formulate guidelines and the law only gives very general criteria. The board considers mortgage financing, income expense data, tenant income, housing affordability, the price index and other factors in setting the guidelines. One tool the board has used since its inception is called the commensurate rent adjustment. What the commensurate rent adjustment determines is how much would rents have to change to keep the NOI constant for owners of buildings that contain rent stabilized units. In other words, if the net operating income was say $40 and the income was 100, how much would rents have to change to keep that NOI at $40 in absolute fixed dollars? How much would rents have to be adjusted to keep that NOI figure constant or that the same absolute number? Andrew, just to, to be clear, that that's a comparing just for a rent stabilized unit itself from year to year. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. So it's not it's not the, the total building if it had a mix of rent regulated and non regulated, but it's comparing kind of apples to apples uh, rent regulated over time. Correct, because these adjustments would be given to the stabilized units in that building. So it's to keep that that particular NOI generated from that particular unit. Um, constant from year to year. And the NOI figures is from the RPI e reports? Um, the, what's used in this formula is the percentage of costs um, is from the, uh, the INE report. In other words, how what percentage of costs of a dollar is, is um, what percentage of the dollar is cost, I'm sorry. But there isn't an NOI figure that we use per se, because NOI is gonna be different from building to building. We don't take an average, we don't take a number. Um, what we're saying, if costs are a certain percentage, say, you know, 65% of the dollar or 65 cents on a dollar, what would you have to do in order to keep that remaining, um, you know, 35 cents of NOI, the same 35 cents the next year? First, keep it the same 35% the next year. Uh, yeah, or 35 cents. If you're breaking it, 35%, correct. I mean, you could look at it either way. If, if you're taking it as a dollar, uh, any any dollar of income, 65 cents, say, goes to, to um, cost. So 65 cents of that dollar, the remaining amount of that dollar or the 35% or 35 cents, is it would then be considered in the NOI. The first commensurate method is called the net revenue approach. While this formula takes into consideration the term of leases actually signed by tenants, it does not adjust owner's NOI for inflation. The net revenue formula is presented in two ways. First, adjusting for the mix of lease terms, and second, adding an assumption for rent stabilized apartment turnover and the impact on revenue from vacancy leases. 
um, under the net revenue formula, a guideline that would preserve NOI in the face of this year's 3% increase in the price index is two and a, a quarter percent for a one year lease and four and a half percent for a two year lease. Using this formula and adding assumptions for the impact of vacancy leases on revenues when apartments experience turnover results in guidelines of 2% for a one year lease and three point three and a quarter for two year leases. Andrew, just to be clear, or I, I want to confirm my understanding, um, the vacancy factor, um, the impact of the, the 2019 uh, law means that there aren't vacancy increases, but it means that some preferential rents may go up to um, uh, to the legal rent. Is that is that why the increases for the vacancy factor included net revenue formula are lower than for the for the no vacancy factor net revenue formula? Correct. I mean, it's still based on the fact that there is an increase that can be taken on those leases. Um, I, I will say, and it's and it's in the report that the data that we're using is from the 2019 registration file. We don't have the data yet for the current, um, the, the most current data. Those, excuse me, would be leases that were, you know, what the rent was on April 1st of 2020. So that amount may differ, but at that time it was, the median increase was 3.97% um, for those vacancy and that um, could change. Remember also though, that the guideline increases were also toward vacancy as well, um, leases in our past order. So it's not just those preferential rents that those vacant um, leases can also take our, our adjustments set by the board. So that, that would factor in as well. So the second commensurate method considers the mixed lease of terms um, like the net uh, revenue formula, but we try to adjust the NOI portion of the dollar um, to reflect inflation. Um, so we wanna keep both the operating and maintenance costs constant, which we use our price index to adjust that, but the NOI part, we're going to use inflate, uh, you know, the CPI or inflation to adjust that. So a guideline that would preserve NOI in the face of the 1.5% increase in the CPI and 3% increase in the PIOC is 2.75% for a one-year lease and 5.75% for a two-year lease. Guidelines using this formula and adding the estimated impact of vacancy leases are 2.5% for one year leases and four and a half percent for two year leases. And then finally, there's a traditional formula that's been around since the inception of the board um, in 69. Um, and the traditional commensurate yields 2% for a one year lease and 2.4% for two year leases. And this reflects the increase of the operating cost of 3% found in the price index and the projection of 1.3% increase next year. Um, so each of these formula that I presented today can be sorted, thought as a starting point for deliberations. The data presented in other rent guided annual research reports such as the income and affordability study and the income and expense study, uh, along with public testimony can be used in conjunction with these various commensurates to determine um, appropriate rent adjustments. Arthur, I just had one question about, there was the um, the forecasting of what costs would be in the future and, and you had forecasted that the real estate taxes would go down. What, like, what, what you, can you talk a little bit about that? I thought taxes never Yeah, happened. so the tentative assessment role came out for mm -hmm. um, buildings that will be billed for fiscal year 2020. 2022. Mm -hmm. And finance actually adjust assessments downward. Um, they used a, a methodology that I am not, um, I, I'm not sure how they did it, but they determined they were trying to get the impact of, of um, the pandemic um, mm -hmm. on the income portion of how they determined taxes. Uh, so they came up with a formula or methodology that would do that. As a result, um, the assess, assessments are for the first time in forever. It seems like a long, long time. Assessments are planning to go uh, going down according to the tentative assessment role. Now, that's not the final role, 
The right. final rule will come out in May. Um, so we'll have a better sense and we could take a look at that after we, we get that. But that's why, um, so projected costs, that's why taxes are projected to go down 5% because those assessed values are supposed to go down. Um, Is that because DOF, when they, they do look at like the income generated by the building? Yeah, part good. of the tax bill is based on the income generated by the building, correct. So they tried to make an adjustment for that with, with the pandemic. So um, we'll see if their um, methodology is correct or not going forward. But um, they wanted to recognize that and understand that for, for, um, for building owners. And then I just had a, a diff another question. So overall costs, I think, went up, you said, about 3%. So even yep. though insurance went up 18%, it's, that's because of the weighting of each yeah. Unit exactly. the taxes are part of that, so yeah, that the taxes the taxes are a third of the entire index, so that was three, I think, three point nine percent. Insurance is roughly five percent, I believe, uh, of the entire thing. So uh, even though it had a large increase, it had, um, and that was probably offset by fuel costs that went down three point three percent, which is I think roughly 10% of the price index. So these things like sort of, so you almost, I always look at the price index. I wanna know what happened with real estate taxes. That's sort of where you start because it's such a large portion. And then these other things will sort of out offset themselves um, depending on what's going on. So, but that that's the reason why. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's all about the waiting. Right. Great. If you um, have no further questions, I'm fine uh, taking anything. You, if you have any questions in the future, please let me know anything that I can answer. Um, but that is my presentation. So David, I'll throw it back to you. Okay. I, I think we're ready just to move on to our next presentation and I'll introduce our research director, Brian Hoberman, who will present the 2021 mortgage survey report. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm going to set up my screen share. Let me see, I, does that look good? Everyone can see that? Yep. Okay, great. Um, this is the 2021 mortgage survey report. Uh, what is the mortgage survey report? It highlights changes in the city's multifamily lending market uh, over the prior year. Um, the report is divided into three sections. The mortgage survey analysis, which looks at all of this year's respondents, longitudinal analysis, which looks at only those lenders responding in both the current and prior year. And in addition to the survey analysis, we also examine sales data of buildings that contain rent stabilized units. Average interest rates decreased this year to a record low in the survey. Uh, the average interest rate for new multifamily mortgages was 3.76%, a decline of 24 basis points or 6% from a year earlier. It was the third consecutive year it has declined and the lowest ever recorded in this survey going back to 1981. Uh, this graph shows average interest rates going back to 81 uh, and interest rates were significantly higher uh, and the double digits throughout the 80s fell to single digits in the 90s and this year's average interest rate, uh, like I said, fell to 3.76%, uh, uh, the lowest uh, recorded in the survey. Some lenders charge a separate upfront fee, uh, those are called points, as a direct cost to borrowers. The average service fee charged on new loans by lenders rose to 0.38 points, up from last year's record low of 0.22 points. Among survey respondents, they ranged between zero and one, with four surveyed lenders charging no points on new loans. This graph shows the average points charged for new mortgages since uh, 1981. As the graph shows, the fees were much higher in the 80s and 90s, but have fallen well below 1% uh, since the 2000s. And after falling to a record low last year, they rose uh, this year to 0.38. The average volume of new mortgage originations in our survey fell from 127 last year to 98 this year, 23% uh, decline. The average number of refinance loans experienced a much greater fall, declining from 112 last year to 25 this year, 
a 78% drop. Uh, this year's lenders adjusted some lending practices. Uh, among the surveyed institutions, the typical maximum loan to value ratio, which is the maximum amount respondents were willing to lend based on a building's value, ranged from 65% to 82.5%. This year's average was 74.1%, an increase of 1.1 percentage points from last year's 73%. The debt service coverage ratio, which is NOI divided by debt service, also rose slightly up from 1.21 to 1.24 this year. This graph illustrates the lender's standards for maximum loan to value ratio since 1996. This year, the LTV ratio increased by 1.1 percentage points from last year to 74.1%. This graph illustrates vacancy and collection losses since 1996, with uh, the most recent year on top. Average vacancy and collection losses this year increased for the first time in eight years, following a record low last year. Vacancy and collection losses rose from 2.17% last year to 2.83% this year. Uh, next, we'll move into the longitudinal analysis, which examines findings among institutions that responded to our survey both last year and this year. Among the eight respondents that completed the survey this year, also, all also responded last year. The eight lenders that make up the longitudinal group and their responses from both this year and last are compared to this in this section to illustrate changes between the two years. Now, like the main survey analysis, the longitudinal group saw interest rates fall Interest rates this year averaged 3.76%, down from 4.02% a year earlier. And among the longitudinal group, average points offered by lenders rose from 0.11 last year to 0.38 this year. The average maximum loan to value ratio declined among the longitudinal group this year, falling from 75% to 74.1%. The average debt service ratio rose slightly up from 1.21 to 1.24 this year. And like the main mortgage survey analysis, vacancy and collection losses increased to 2.83% this year from 1.93% last year. Um, due to the ramifications of the pandemic, many lenders offered varying terms for payment deferrals and forbearance, uh, thereby reducing for the time being the risk of non-performance and foreclosure. Lenders reported differing proportions of rent collection issues among their borrowers, ranging from between 7% and 100% of lenders' portfolios facing lower rent collections at times this past year. And of the borrowers with collection issues, the average gap ranged between 10 and 30% lower than normal uh, for at least a part of the year. Now next, we'll move on to the analysis of buildings that contain rent-stabilized units. In 2020, um, 470 buildings were sold in New York City, a 28% decline from the prior year. Uh, looking at sales data by building size, sales decline varied. Among the smallest size stabilized buildings in 2020, six to 10 unit buildings, sales volume was down 35%. And among 11 to 19 unit buildings, sales fell 28%. Among 20 to 99 unit buildings, sales volume declined 16%. And among the largest buildings containing 100 or more units, the sales volume was down 27%. Examining sales volume around the city, every borough saw sales volume decline. Sales fell 31% in the Bronx, 27% in Brooklyn, 25% in Manhattan, and the most in Queens falling 33%. Overall sales were down 28% citywide. And like in prior years, uh, Staten Island is not included in our analysis because there uh, are typically too few building sales in that borough. This graph illustrates uh, over the 18 year period for which we have data, citywide sales were at their peak in 2005 when 1,816 buildings were sold but sales reached their lowest point this past year when 470 buildings were sold. Now we'll shift to an analysis of sales prices of buildings. The median citywide sales price was $4 million in 2020. The highest median sales price was in Manhattan 
$5.8 million, followed by the Bronx at $5.1 million, Brooklyn at $2.9 million, and Queens at $2.3 million. Looking at sales prices by building size, among the smallest buildings, those that contain six to 10 residential units, the median sales price citywide was $2.1 million. Among 11 to 19 unit buildings, the median price was $4.2 million. Buildings with 20 to 99 units sold at a median price of $7.5 million. And among the largest buildings, which contain 100 or more units, they sold for a median price of $34.2 million. So to sum up this year's mortgage survey report, average interest rates declined to a record low, but both service fees as well as vacancy collection losses increased. In addition, the number of buildings containing rent stabilized units sold declined to their lowest level since uh, the RGB began collecting this data. Uh, thanks, I'll now take any questions uh, you may have. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, I think I may have asked this before, but would it be possible to show the um, uh, sales price per unit average? Because I think that it's really hard to really interpret the, the numbers when you're just aggregating it by building size. So if you knew something about you know, the cost or the purchase price per unit, you get a sense over time how things have shifted. And again, that's not precise because some, you know, depends on the percentage of rent stabilized units in a building and the mix of unit, of, of unit size, but at least it gives you something a little bit more granular. And I don't know if it's possible, but I think it'd be great if we could get over time the price per unit to see have they, have they been going down, have they been going up, you know, is there any pattern at all? Yeah, we, we, we uh, did add average number of residential units sold, um, but we didn't discuss, we didn't break it down by price. Yeah, uh, we just average, you'd just be um, dividing up the um, you know, number of units by the price, I think, right? Right, yeah, that would be something we could do. Yeah, I'll talk to Andrew about that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, certainly we could do that, Alex. How far did you, would we I don't know, if, if you go back, you know, I don't know, it depends how hard it would be, but if you go back 10 years, I think it'd be interesting to see. Obviously inflation's a factor too, but given all the changes that have occurred recently, I think it'd be interesting to see our prices, go, you know, changing. Okay, yeah, the only one caveat I would say is that we may be able to do it at uh, certainly at the borough level, I, you know, some of the, you know, building size by boroughs may not allow us to have, there may be gaps in those particular mm -hmm. yeah. years. So it may be more useful just to look at it citywide and by borough that, um, rather than by building size, but we'll, we'll take yeah. a look. No, I don't know. I, I think when you, do, I don't think you need to look oh, at that's it. That's right. Right. Size. Right. Once you do the unit, you don't, you're yeah. right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. So okay. we should. Yeah, no, I wasn't. I think that would be interesting. Yep, you're absolutely right. So I, I don't see a problem with doing it by borough as well. So I would I would actually be interested to see it from 2008, just because of what happened during that period. We had a, a crash of multifamily housing lending and like to see what happened after that, which was sort of like a reset a few years later so that we could see the whole picture of like what the change is. Yeah, the changes in the value too, right? So during 2008, uh, when the market crash also, you know, from values really went down and that caused the uh, sale price. You know, people to sell their properties, they couldn't sell it at, you know, they didn't want to lose money because the, the properties were on the value or on the water, in other words. Well, that yeah, I guess that that's the question that would be answered, right? If if the if the unit prices were, yeah, that that would be the the question that would be answered. Did the unit price get impacted by that period? Yeah, I I third the uh, that request actually. I think that would be <laughs> so. Yeah, um, good question as well. I mean, it's like so we saw that there were. Um, there were increases in loan to value ratio, 
but at the same time, uh, there was a decline in uh, actual sales. So those two pieces together, I mean, it's like, wh what do you think uh, that says about the market right now? Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, I mean, what does that say about the market right now, those two pieces together in particular? Um, well, I mean, I, I mean, you know, obviously everything was disrupted in the past year and it's still disrupted. So I, 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 I think, I think, I'll, I think we have to wait and see what happens with the market and, you know, going forward when, when, when the city re is recovering for co from COVID this year, I think we'll, we'll get a full picture probably uh, by well, next year's study. In general, what drives uh, sort of increases in loan to value ratio? Um, I guess it depends on the, you know, lenders, um, how much risk they're willing to take in terms of lending, I, I would imagine, um, you know. Um, so we're I, they're willing to take on more risk now? That, I think what, that's a perfect question for Michael. Um, when he comes, Michael Edelman is gonna be speaking to that very thing. So he's the expert I would tend to um, defer to what he would say that, but I would hold that question for him okay. because he's definitely going to be discussing that and what they're seeing right now um, right. with with the lending market. So, so he would be able to explain that better than we could, I think. Great, thank you. Uh, any more questions for Brian? Okay, that's great. We're, 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 you know, we have a tight agenda today, so it's great. Uh, we're actually a few minutes ahead of schedule. I see we've been uh, joined both by Rafael Sestero and Mike Edelman. We're going to first hear from Rafael Sestero, who uh, has given wise counsel to the board uh, in, in previous years. Um, he is currently the president and CEO of the Community Preservation Corporation. Um, uh, let, we're, we're, it's a little bit on the early side, but let me just check in. Rafael, are you uh, uh, up and ready to go? Uh, sure. Um, I am happy to, to, to jump in early. Uh, no problem. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen if I, if I can, because I have a few, uh, a few slides I'd like to go through uh, with, with everybody, if that's, uh, if that's okay. Um, but Raphael, gonna... we, we did send your slides around to the board members, so hopefully- Oh, you did? All right. Yeah, so but, they, if, so... but if you can- Please still put them up for everyone who's watching, but they did get um, the oh, PDF. Oh, good. So. All right. Well, let me, uh, I'm not the wizard with Zoom, so bear with me. Let me see if I can, uh, if I can actually do this. So, I think, beautiful. Did I do it? Yep. All right. You Excellent. Did. Okay. Um, well, um, thanks for uh, th thanks for having me uh, again uh, this year. Um, I'm sorry that uh, we're we're not all in person, uh, but uh, I hope everybody is uh, safe and healthy and uh, um, looking forward to uh, to moving on from uh, from from this this uh, situation we've been in for the last year. Um, what I thought I would do is, um, you know, three kind of basic uh, things. I'll tell you a little bit about CPC. Some of you have, have heard this because you, you've been on the board. Um, just take two minutes and, and, and talk to you about CPC. And then I'm gonna dive straight into our portfolio in our portfolio um, and what's kind of, and, and then beyond that, dig even deeper to, to sort of dig into what trends we're seeing related to um, re revenue and, and rent collection and uh, expenses. Uh, and then I'm happy to, you know, whatever, uh, Andrew, if people want to ask, whatever questions people have, I'm happy to, happy to answer. Um, so real quick, CPC is a 45 year old nonprofit uh, organization. Um, our mission uh, uh, is um, to use our uh, resources and our toolbox um, to create housing, uh, that's affordable and that uh, helps um, uh, restore uh, underserved communities. Uh, we've been doing that um, in New York City and around New York State um, for, for our history. Um, we have uh, over our uh, 45 years, we've invested um, nearly $11 billion um, in capital um, in New York, um, seven and a half billion of that uh, in the five boroughs uh, of, of New York City. Um, we, um, we, we, are, we, we are a lender and we are an equity provider um, as well. 
Um, we, uh, le- we, we put new capital uh, out uh, the last five years. We've averaged about 650, 600, a little less than 650 million a year in, 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 new, um, in, in new capital uh, into neighborhoods. Um, about uh, 53% of that uh, in New York City, 340 million a year in New York City. Um, we have, uh, in total, we service, um, you know, uh, almost 2,000 individual loans. It's about three and a half billion dollars of long-term permanent mortgages on uh, the properties uh, that, that we provide debt to. Our owners are both um, for-profit owners, mostly small buildings and nonprofit owners, and our portfolio is a mix of subsidized, affordable, and um, uh, uh, regulated uh, uh, housing uh, in, in New York City. Um, of that uh, three and a half billion, uh, 60% of that or 2.1 billion is in uh, the five boroughs uh, of New York City. Um, the data that I'm gonna share with you um, uh, next uh, is, um, it, it, it focuses specifically on that 2.1 billion um, in New York City. Um, so we, 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 we narrowed it down and focused in on New York City um, so, that, so that we can sort of see the trends uh, in, in the five boroughs. Um, so portfolio wide, how's the portfolio doing? Um, I would say hanging in there, uh, not, not, not doing great. Um, as you can see, um, historically, um, our delinquency rate on our um, um, portfolio has been sub 2%. Um, since the onset of the pandemic, we've spiked up as high as 10%. Uh, today, we sit at around 5.8% uh, uh, or about $122 million um, of, uh, of our portfolio um, is, is currently delinquent. Um, and I'll get into the whys of that um, in, in, a, in a second. Um, uh, the second thing that, that, that I would say about our portfolio is in addition to that 122 million that's delinquent, uh, we have a, about another 137 million uh, in which we're seeing some signs of distress. Um, and, and, and that could be anywhere, anything from they're actually in a forbearance agreement. Um, we, we have about 80 million um, that are in a forbearance agreement uh, with us, meaning that they have come to us and said, we cannot uh, make our mortgage payments. So uh, we've, we've entered into forbearance for them. Um, but we also have, um, you know, another subset uh, of loans, uh, about uh, 60 million uh, that are uh, on our watch list. They're paying, they might be paying late. Um, they have debt service coverage that has gone below 1.1. Um, could, be, could be any number of things, but we're watching uh, that uh, portfolio closely. So um, you know, I, I, that's why I say the portfolio is hanging in there. In total, we've got about 12% of our portfolio that's either delinquent or, or showing some signs of distress. Um, we're, we're watching it, you know, very closely. We're, we're, we're in constant contact, um, you know, with our owners. Um, and we've started to collect information uh, that allows us to kind of dig into what we think some of the, some of, some of the biggest challenges are, which I'd like to share with you. Um, uh, quickly uh, right now. Um, the first. Can I just ask a quick question. Sure. Of course. Oh, just by, delinquent. How do you define delinquent? Is that more than thirty days late? More than sixty? Um, I, this is sixty days delinquent. Um, uh, so we, we 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 track obviously all of it, but this this number is sixty days. Right. So great, you know, great greater than. Okay. 30 thank days. you. Um, so what are we seeing? Um, at first blush, you look at this and you say, well, I mean, occupancy and collections are about the same, which is a little bit surprising. Um, when, when, when you, you know, think about all the things that, that people are experiencing and, uh, obviously the, the unemployment and, 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 and issues, uh, that, that have been brought up by the pandemic, um, and we were actually quite surprised by these numbers uh, that, um, that, that occupancy and collections have remained um, high. I think when you peel the onion back a little bit deeper, um, the, the, the story's a, a little more nuanced than just this one slide. Um, the first thing is when you look at um, small buildings, so buildings between five and 20 units, um, you know, this is a snapshot of six, a six building portfolio uh, work 
we're doing the number crunching on the entire small building portfolio that we have. But when you look at collections in small buildings, the picture's a significantly more troubling. Um, we have, you know, in this portfolio, you see the collections dropped as low as 45% and then have kind of gone up and hovered around um, the 60% um, since uh, the onset of the pandemic. Um, so small buildings, we think, um, are um, experiencing more distress um, in collections um, than larger buildings. I think the other thing that's important to note is that typically in our portfolio, small buildings are not the subsidized buildings that we have financed in partnership with, um, you know, with, with the city. Um, when you look at those buildings, um, you know, this is a, a, another, you know, quick snapshot of a portfolio. Um, you see that rent collections have been, have been higher and um, have, have, you know, ho hovered around, um, you know, the 80, uh, 85% uh, uh, level um, since the pandemic. So subsidized larger buildings, um, collections uh, have been stronger. Um, I think that makes sense if you think about what a subsidized building is. People are income qualified to, 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 to move into those buildings so that, um, you know, they're, you know, most of the, if, if, uh, barring job loss, most folks in those buildings are able to, to keep up with the rent on a, on a regular basis. So, um, so I think the picture around revenue is a little nuanced, um, but Still, I think overall, uh, obviously, better than we thought. Um, Rafael, Rafael, can yeah. I just ask? Um, just sure. you chose those two snapshots, and I understand, you know, that you're you're still massaging your data, but um, we're still collecting. It, actually, but... <laughs> from, from the from the board's perspective, should we treat these as representative, or like 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 how did you choose these two examples? I guess. Yeah. No. I mean, we try. We so so we're 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 uh, data collection is ongoing um, for us. We do not have um, all of the income and expense uh, information from 2020. We haven't received it yet. Um, so that's why um, you know the 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 port the we we tried to look at representative snapshots um, of, of our portfolio. And we looked at um, what we consider to be a typical portfolio of, you know, of small buildings and a typical portfolio of larger buildings. So um, I can't guarantee that three months from now, these numbers are gonna look the same, um, but uh, once we get all the information in, but I think they're fairly representative of what's happening. Um, and I think, frankly, fairly consistent with what with what other people um, are seeing out there um, in in the market. Uh, Raphael, are these yeah. portfolios located primarily in a single neighborhood? Or are they spread around? They're 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 spread around. Our um, our portfolio is um, you know is largely Brooklyn, the Bronx, and Manhattan. Um, we have a little bit uh, in Queens, and we have a little bit in Staten Island, but it's largely in those three uh, boroughs. So I guess what um, I mean is these uh, snapshots, this bigger building, smaller buildings. Yeah, Alex, I don't, I don't actually know. Um, I can find out. I don't know um, what uh, neighborhoods these building, th these portfolios are in. But let me. Um, the only reason the one... I'm asking is it's possible that some neighborhoods may have been affected, you know, for more sure, really than others in terms of income loss. There, there, there's absolutely no doubt about that, and I'm happy to to talk about that a little bit. I mean. Uh, Kings County has been hit much harder from the multifamily uh, real estate perspective than 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 any other county. Um, you know, um, Freddie Mac has downgraded Kings County. Um, Freddie Mac has downgraded all of New York City, but it has specifically downgraded Kings County. Um, and so, but let me just, with the wonders of Zoom, um, let me just quickly see if I can find out what boroughs those are in, um, Alex. Um, So, and if I can, I will, um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll relay that as, as we go forward, but clearly Kings County has been hit harder. Um, and, and actually we had, um, you know, if you go back to, to if I go back to this slide, you, you can kind of see where borough on a borough by borough basis. Interestingly, we're seeing, we personally are seeing less distress in Kings County um, than in, um, than in, than in um, Manhattan. Um, or the Bronx um, from, from the perspective of forbearance only, right? We've had a much lower um, forbearance rate in, in Kings County. 
not entirely sure at this point, given that our data collection is still ongoing, what that really means. Um, but um, but I think we um, um, you know we we are we are generally um, seeing um, you know distress across um, across all the boroughs, mm -hmm. with Kings County being particularly um, uh, troubling. That, Raphael, could that be simply yeah. because of the smaller buildings are in Brooklyn, so the forbearance total would be less, or is that? So I uh, just got I just got a note. Um, yes, um, Andrew, the the small loan scattered site is in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, the large loan um, sample that we uh, showed is in is in the Bronx, and clearly building size differentiates between those between those two locations. Um, so clearly, building size could be. Um, could could be could be part of what's what's driving it, um, you know. I think there there you know there could be other things, but building size certainly could be could be part of that. I I meant to, I don't know if someone if you said this already, but the first the two examples and those are yep. buildings that include rent stabilized house, rent stabilized units. Yes, yes. Every every, every everything in our portfolio um, is is rent stabilized. And do you know what percentages of those buildings are rent stabilized and not? Well, um, the uh, I don't know on the smaller building portfolio. I do know the large building portfolio is a subsidized portfolio. So that's a portfolio that has um, HPD in it. So 100% of those units are rent stabilized. I'm sorry, I just have to follow up on that. Um, sure. So, so just to clarify, when you're speaking of the larger the buildings that are on the larger side, those are definitely rent stabilized. But when you're speaking of the smaller buildings, no, it's okay. No, I'm sorry. Everything in our portfolio is rent stabilized. I don't know. The, the question that was asked was specifically, do I know if 100 percent of the small building units in, in, in that entire in that portfolio, if 100 percent of them are rent stabilized? My assumption is that they are, but I don't know specifically whether they are. On the large portfolio, I know that 100% of those units are rent stabilized because I know that that portfolio has HPD subsidy in it. And if it has HPD subsidy in it, then there are 100% of the units are, are rent stabilized. If that, oh, so if that makes to, sense. So just, to, so just to clarify, I'm sorry, because I'm hearing two different things. So you're saying, I'm hearing on the one hand, all of all of the buildings are rent stabilized. And then the other thing I'm hearing is for the smaller buildings, it's not clear whether 100% of them are rent stabilized. Units. So um, yes, on a unit basis, the buildings are rent stabilized, but as you know, not uh, sometimes there you can have units that, that, are, that are out of rent stabilized in, so they may in, be in, in a use. specific building. Um, and I just don't know um, specifically whether or not um, those, uh, uh, I can, we can get you that information. I can, I can certainly get it to you as a follow-up, but I don't know off the top of my head if um, the small building portfolio has any subsidy in it and whether it's 100%, 100% of the units are rent stabilized. So just to be clear, so some of the small buildings that we're talking about, like theoretically could have 10 units, but one of them be stabilized and the rest of the nine might not. Just so I, I'm clarifying. I, I, why don't, why don't, rather than, rather than me dealing hypotheticals, why don't I get you the exact um, specifics on that portfolio? I, based on my experience, I think it is highly unlikely that it's one unit is rent stabilized and 10 or not. I think it, it, it if it's anything, it's, it's nine units are rent stabilized and one isn't, given what I know about our portfolio. But rather than deal in hypotheticals, let me get, get you that very specific breakdown of that portfolio. Yes, that would be helpful because we, we do often see um, there's often waning with mixed use buildings. A lot of them tend to have, um, you know, that the, the stabilized units go down as time progresses. No, 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 of course. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I understand what you're, what, what, what you're saying, but let, let me, um, let me get you the specifics you. Um, uh, on that. Um, so um, just, um, 
if there are any other questions about what what I've what I've shared so far. Um, so we then, uh, if not, we then we then uh, have started to look uh, uh, deeply at expenses. And as I've presented in previous uh, years, our expenses um, and the and 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 the um, and, and the expense study that that the board does. Are, are all are always very similar. Um, there, you know, there's differences and nuances and different uh, different things. Ours tend to, to to track maybe a little higher in certain categories, um, and uh, the comparison of 2019 um, re really is no different. There's there, there's nothing remarkable about this comparison um, uh, when when we look at. 2018 or 2017 or 2016. Um, it's 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 kind of the same, um, you know, um, when we look at our portfolio versus um, the the board uh, the board study. Um, what's you know what what we have found um, you know so far um, in our in our in our data collection um, is that um, expenses from 2019 to 2020. Have gone up fairly significantly. Um, so um, we 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 have sent, right now we have looked at 99 projects. Um, it's about um, uh, 3,800 units. Um, it's spread across our portfolio. It's not there's no there's not anything specific about it in terms of borough or anything. It's it's across our portfolio. Um, and what we've seen is that. Um, Expenses have gone up um, fairly significantly. We've seen a significant increase in maintenance, um, uh, which I, I think is is likely attributed to in, in increased, you know, um, cleaning protocols and other things um, related to, to to the pandemic. Um, we've seen uh, we've also seen a fairly significant jump in um, in insurance. Um, and, uh, and, and we've seen, uh, you know, increases in, in other categories. So overall, we've seen uh, about an 18% increase in expenses 2019 to 2020 based on this sampling, uh, sample of 99 projects uh, that, uh, that, that we looked at um, in our portfolio. So what do I think that means? I think, um, you know, I think revenue and income is, um, either it, it's, it's, it's a little down, it's more down in some places, uh, at best it's, it's held, um, and expenses are up. And so I think that's a lot of what's driving, um, the distress, um, that, that we're seeing in our portfolio. Um, although I, I will say still, what I said at the very beginning is I'm actually surprised it's not worse. I'm surprised we haven't seen more distress than we've seen. Which is a remarkable thing, given that we were always sub two percent, and now we're now we're at almost six percent delinquency, and we've got another six percent that 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 we're tracking, you know, as distressed. But you know, if you if 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 we had been talking a year ago, I would have <laughs> I would have thought that we'd be in a lot worse shape than we are. And I think stimulus dollars, and there's a whole bunch of things that have gone into that. Um, and I think, um, so I think that's why I say, I think the portfolio um, is, is hanging in there. Rafael, I have a quick question just to put that sure. 18 number into, into perspective. Um, does that represent, uh, do you weight these expenses similarly to how the POC, the IOC report uh, does, or is this just the overall number? This is just the number. Okay, what, so it's yeah. not, not weighted like the PIOC. I mean, it's like just because. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I know what you mean by weighted. But uh, weighted based on the on the on the percent of expenses that each of these uh, areas represents. No, no. This is just this is just the numbers. But, but, but Raphael, and I, I don't know if this will be helpful. But that 18.8 percent, the total percentage change, that that that's not an average of the numbers. That's a that's a weighted average right because insurance went up 46 percent, but it's only a small yes, it's, it's well the 18 percent is the is the total difference it's okay. the difference between nine uh, nine thousand per unit per year and ten ten point eight 
Okay, I see. I mean, it's like because that difference, right? I mean, it's like I was automatically thinking about weights, but all right. I mean, it's like that's already built in because it's it's, it's the actual result. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, these are actual costs. So the weight, yeah. you know, the costs are to determine the weight. So you can that's say that insurance is roughly this is the rate of uh, insurance is is about you know ten or eleven percent of the total cost, but that's right. based on the total amount that's been paid, and that's how the RPIE works. The weights are determined by how the owners spend their money. Vice in the price index, we're taking the weights that were determined in the I and E and and putting on those to prices and costs. So it's a, it's two doing two different things. So yeah, no, I I see that now. I see that clearly. Yeah, yeah. No, I figured right to how this is weighted, but of course, yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's, I mean, that's, that, that's all that I had. Um, happy to answer um, any other questions. So, so Raphael, um, we often, or I've often, I think in the past years have asked you to kind of read the tea leaves. Like could, so would you kind of give us your, I mean, you're, you're deep in this market. You have a lot of data that other, other people don't have, you know, the board to some extent is, is going blind because a lot of our data ends in 2019. And so, we're looking to experts like you and to Mike to kind of give us a sense of, you know, the, the yeah. health of the housing stock, you know, today and going forward. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think, I think we're still at a very precarious, uh, we're in a very precarious um, uh, spot. Um, and I think there's a few factors that, that drive that. Um, I think that the I I, th I think that while I can't prove it scientifically, um, I think there is no doubt that the stimulus um, dollars, enhanced unemployment, the the one-time stimulus checks, have propped up um, in a pretty significant way the revenue side of the equation. Um, we haven't yet seen the rent subsidy uh, really start to flow in significant ways, so I I think that's a positive and that can only help uh, the revenue side of the equation if there's um, significant um, um, you know, uptake of those, uh, of that program. Um, you know, I think, I, I think it's hard to know, for example, you know, it's hard to know whether the insurance numbers are gonna keep rising the way they're rising. So I think on the expense side, it's hard to know um, you know, what, the, what the future holds. But I think the other thing that I think about is we are starting to see interest rates creep up. We, we have, we have been in this incredibly low interest rate environment, um, and interest rates, um, are starting to, to, to creep up. Um, and, and, you know, in particular, the, the 10 year treasury is, is starting to creep up and, and most experts, of which I'm not one, but most economic experts um, think that that's going to continue uh, throughout um, throughout 2021. And so, what does that mean? That means the the cost of borrowing um, is going to go up, and so debt service costs are going to go up. And, and so, I think we're still at a very very challenging and very um, very precarious position um, in the rental housing market um, in New York City. Um, and I think it's it's on both sides of the equation. I don't think there's any winners at the moment uh, in, in 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 where we are in um, uh, in in the housing market uh, in New York. Let me go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, am I? Can I ask? Uh, can, okay, great. Um, so. Thanks so much for your testimony. I'm wondering approximately how many buildings you you mentioned, like the portfolio. Uh, approximately how many buildings um, does your company represent overall? Um, it's uh, it's 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 about it's about two thousand um, individual loans, um, and um, you know. Some of that is one building. Some of that is multiple buildings. Um, so you know we're 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 a few thousand um, uh, buildings in total representative in our portfolio. And uh, what went into the determination of the ninety nine projects that were part of the sample for this particular report? How did um, how did you determine which buildings were part of this particular um, report and sample? 
we we went out and 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 have been have been collecting income and expense data from all of our borrowers um, across um, uh, our portfolio. Um, and these, again, this is not, I want to be very clear. This is not meant to be scientifically, scientific data. I'm here to provide our best understanding of what's happening in our portfolio. So these are the 99 projects that came, that, that came in and that we had enough time to analyze. This is not meant to be a scientifically significant uh, representation. But I think in the real world, um, this, is, this is a fair representation of, of, of what I would expect our portfolio to, 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 to look like once we have collected all the data. And so we typically get, um, you know, in any given year, we get, you know, 70 or 80% compliance with our requests for income and expense data. Um, and I, I think we'll get we'll get at least that um, this time, but we're not you know we're not we're not done with that process yet. Alex, um, Rafael, thank you. Um, the I was not surprised, I guess, by the big increase in maintenance, but it's interesting that um, this is I guess the question is a bit for Andrew with the um, PIOC study where we had, was something like a three percent. It was much smaller percent increase in maintenance and given what the protocols with COVID, I would think that there would be a high level of increase. So I, I so I, in some ways is a question, I guess, for Andrew about that discrepancy, about this difference in the maintenance costs. And I guess one other quick question in terms of forbearance. So th that the buildings and forbearance are not counted uh, those that are delinquent, correct? That's correct. Yeah. And, and it's forbearance is something where the owner goes to the lender and asks for a deal yep. to postpone or reduce the interest payments. Yeah. So very, so, so very early in the, in the, in the pandemic, um, um, we worked with, um, you know, our, our investor base. So our, uh, these loans are typically held by, Either um, you know we're the we're the originator and we're the servicer, but the end uh, holder is either Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, which, as we all know, announced forbearance programs very early in the pandemic. And then the other um, investors for us are are the New York State Common Retirement Fund and um, the New York City Pension uh, Funds. And so we worked very closely with uh, with those um, uh, uh, organizations to create forbearance models that were similar to what um, was happening um, at the federal level. Um, and so we had any number of at, at the peak we had something like 150 million of loans in forbearance. But over the course of the 12 months, you know, many of them have roll have rolled off. Um, so. So those, those, that represents what's remaining in forbearance, which are owners that have came in and applied for forbearance under the programs that we were operating with our various uh, end investors. Thanks. Cecilia? Um, so can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Hi, Raphael, um, um, you just mentioned, what is it, 150 million loans in forbearance or out of the 150 million? No, no. Can you explain that? Right, right now, today, sitting here today, we have $80 million worth of loans in forbearance. Okay. At the peak, at the peak, you know, back in this last summer, we peaked out at about 150 million. So that was the most we ever had uh, that were in forbearance at any one time. Um, and that number has has come down. And, and today we sit at 80 million. Okay, so so do you see that any of those forbearance have redefaulted and requested new forbearance or? or... Um, not, um, not requested new forbearance, but we have had um, borrowers request extensions. So that, so, so that their forbearance period was 60 days or 90 days and they got to the end of the 60 or 90 days and they asked for, for extensions. For and extension. and, and some, some of what's in the 80 are loans that, that requested extensions. I see. I but see. We, are, we are not right now getting any significant 
volume of new requests for forbearance. So the what so, is so, the most? Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say so the so the so the inflow of requests has has pretty much stopped. Okay. Okay. And what is the most? Um, what is the highest term that you have provided on extensions? You know, I don't know specifically. Um, I, I, I probably should have had um, our head of servicing join me on this. Um, I, I, but I think we do. Um, I, I think we do as much as sixty day um, extensions. Um, but um, um, I think that might be the average extension, and some some may be longer than that. Mm -hmm. Shayla. Hey, um, so I, I think my question is more about what you, you know, right now you're like saying that the stock that you're looking at is hanging on. Uh, what do you anticipate the impact of two, you know, the $2.1 billion uh, that the state is going to now start? We don't know what the program actually looks like, but we'll start um, uh, paying back rents uh, for many folks who are going to apply uh, throughout the state um, through um, the rent relief program. And so what do you anticipate uh, that will do to the forbearance or to the projects that are uh, a little bit on the riskier side or that are barely hanging on? My, my, my hope is, is that that will, um, is that will stabilize, um, you know, the, the, the market, uh, because, um, it will allow, um, you know, um, it will allow, um, tenants to, to have the ability to, to pay the rent and it'll have owners, uh, allow owners to have the ability uh, to, pay, to pay their bills. So my, my, my hope is like everybody that, that that will be a major shot in the arm and that it will really significantly stabilize um, um, the, the housing market in total. Um, and, you know, I, I, I hope that is the case. I think that, um, you know, I think that ultimately, though, long term, um, you know, there's the, the, the question is really about how quickly um, New York City's economy recovers, um, you know, people um, being able to return to work and, and find jobs that pay them, pay them, um, you know, a, a, a decent, uh, a decent wage. So I think, um, I think there still is a bigger picture worry, but I think the, 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 the two, the, the rental assistance um, program can't, it, it can only be a, a positive shot in the arm for the, for the housing market. Um, I mean, I think, can you, would, with all of the, with all of that in view, right, understanding that, I mean, you just sort of highlighted that like unemployment went up really high in the city. We're thinking it's, it's getting better as like the months go on and the city opens up more. Um, but we don't know if we'll be back to normal. And so as a board, um, when we're weighing, you know, people's ability to be able to pay rent and rental increases with, you know, landlords' current, you know, situation of seeing expenses go up due to the pandemic while also not being able to collect, but maybe getting <laughs> some of that back money, but we don't know how much, you know, how that would impact even your portfolio because they're going back a year um, and three months on average. So it just depends on when people stop paying rent and all of that. Um, what do you know? What is what is your um, what are your thoughts for the board on how we see that um, and say people's ability to pay rent and also making sure that this, the housing markets uh, is able to be maintained um, and for people to be able to live in safe and decent housing, which I think we can all agree that we want to make sure the buildings are safe while also um, not hindering people's ability to pay the rents uh, that recognizing that we're in an economic crisis for both landlords and tenants. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, um, I think of the, you know, and I, I, I really don't, I, I don't mean to, um, I'm not sure I know the answer. I'm not sure any of us know the answer. I think, you know, the job, the job of this board has always been the hardest job um, as it relates to housing in New York City. Um, you know, I've been, I've been, um, I've been, involved in housing in, in New York City for 30 plus years. Uh, it's always been the hardest and this year is probably the hardest year ever. Um, you know, I think that, 
And I think it's hard, particularly right now, because there's this big number out there for rental assistance, but we don't actually know how that's going to flow into in, in, into people's hands and, and what the uptake is going to be and how quickly the money is going to get out. So there's a lot of moving parts. Um, and, and so I don't, um, I don't, I don't know that, I don't know that I know the answer, but I'll, I, I will go back to, to what I said, um, what I said before, which is the one thing I'm certain of more than I've ever been in my 30 years uh, of, of doing this um, is that there are no winners and there are no losers at the current moment in the, in the housing market. Um, the old sort of uh, winners and losers argument just goes out the window. Um, and so I think we have to figure out a way to help ensure that the stimulus money uh, gets into the, into the hands of the people that need it um, as quickly as possible. Um, and we have to hope that the unemployment situation continues uh, to, to, to come back. Um, and, and then I guess the last thing I would say is, is that um, the one piece that we haven't talked about and that we haven't really dug into um, other than, you know, a little bit um, in our occupancy numbers, but, um, but you know, vac vacancy rates um, are up in certain places. Um, and how long is that going to, how long is that going to continue? Um, and that's, that's a question that I don't think any of us know. Hopefully, as New York City starts to open, as we start to open up more, people will start coming back and they'll start signing leases. And you hear anecdotal stories that, that that's happening and you hear anecdotal stories that it's not happening. So it's, so it's, it's, it, it's hard for me to sit here today and provide any kind of real clarity on whether, um, whether vacancy rates are gonna, are gonna continue to go down or whether they're gonna stabilize at some level. Any other questions for Rafael? Uh, David, can I just clarify Alex's yes. point? Yeah, so what we do in the price index is for the maintenance, we take a look back to make. It's an average of, I think, the previous three years of what's going on with maintenance, which is normally fine for our projection because, you know, it's, it's pretty, cons you know, steady right. increases in maintenance, but we're not sure what's going to happen. And, and there was nothing that we could do to try to project what would happen to maintenance costs um, because of COVID in the coming year. So we may find that, you know, maintenance is going to go up more than we projected it will, but because we're basing on that, what, what, you know, what had happened, not what's going to happen. Where other parts of our projection, like taxes, because we have that tenant assessment role and how people can project what they're going to be for the next fiscal year, we can actually use data to use that projection, but um, going forward, but we have to use data that was previous to do the maintenance and that's the difference there. So are, are, we, are we also sure that the um that uh that uh CPC's definition of maintenance is the same as as uh, the RGB's because I, I it looked like some things uh that CPC had measured were way lower than what RGB measured I think in the previous slide mm -hmm. and I just wonder if they things were allocated to different buckets list um yeah. between the two of you Perhaps. Like labor and maintenance or maybe some uh, differences because yeah, if you net them out, it kind of comes to the same place. So it may just be the buckets are different. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Um, could Raphael, Raphael, is even labor, Are you? do you guys have more unionized uh, staff who would account for the labor than an average, the average housing stock? Or is it just, I mean, I'm a, and I don't know if this is your, under, my, my understanding just from buildings that are subsidized by HPD, it feels like, you all take a lot greater care in a lot of the maintenance and making sure that like the building financials are made up differently than in like the normal market. There's more speculation on, you know, vacancies on, you know, re renewals or even MCIs and things like that, which in a, in a subsidized world is a lot more restricted. Um, so, um, I, I would, um, my, my assumption would be that the difference in the labor cost is more aligned with what, with what you said, which is given that we have a significantly, uh, a significant 
subsidized portfolio, those buildings tend to have more labor costs attributed to um, to them. Um, and some some you know, and so when you look at it, it doesn't surprise me that much that our labor costs are um, are higher. Um, you know, than than what than, than what the the RGB study just because of the nature of our portfolio. Um, so I, I think I, I think that's probably right. Um, and, and, and you know, I think I, I I I think we use this tried to use the same categories, and so our labor our labor number um, you know in twenty twenty. Um, is going to be the same category as the labor number in 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 2019. Um, on the maintenance, I, I I don't know what you know what the differentiation might be of what we count as maintenance or not, but I don't think it I don't think our maintenance number includes labor. Um, I think labor is in 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 the in the labor number. So, but you know, Andrew, as always, you know, we're happy to, to, to dig into the, the details of all of that, you know, with you and, and then you can share it with. Uh, yeah, know, what would be board. interesting is, do you, do you have a, a sense of when you'll have the large majority of your income and expense data from your folks? Would it you know, be we, we, in May, beginning of June, or is it going to be like September? Or do you have no, any? no. I mean, tip, I mean, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to know. Typical, typical doesn't necessarily apply in the current <laughs> world but but typically we would be done collecting um you know in late may um some years into into june but that would be sort of typical um so i i i think we're i think we're close you know we're, we're 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 inching closer to having a more complete um you know data set and i and i know we're running out of time but just briefly if you can answer of the your portfolio do you have any sense on how commercial units are performing in those? And do you have commercial units in your portfolio? Yeah, we, we do. Um, and, um, you know, commercial has been, you know, has been, has been hit hard. Um, you know, we don't have, you know, an overwhelming, you know, preponderance of commercial, but we do have commercial units, storefronts um, in our, in our portfolio. And, um, you know, the vacant, Vacancy numbers and collection numbers that we've seen so far um, are are significantly worse than than on on the residential side. Um, so that that's clearly a um, you know another issue you know when it comes to, to to the revenue the revenue picture. I just had a quick question. I'm sorry, I can't find the raise hand function. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. Um. um the insurance rates going up. I was just wondering because this this actually did come up a little bit last year. I remember when some um, landlords were talking about how insurance is just going up. Yeah. Do you have any sense of why it's going up so much? <laughs> if uh, if I could if I could explain the insurance industry to you, um, mm -hmm. I I would be uh, I, I would be a lot smarter than I am. I, <laughs> honestly, we don't. I don't. I don't. We don't. We don't have any idea. Okay. And it's. And by the way, this isn't the first time. And I, I, honestly, this isn't the first time this has happened with insurance that all of a sudden it just spikes for some reason. And, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say, well, it's pandemic related, but we've seen it in years where we weren't in pandemics or we weren't in some kind of crisis or we weren't in some, you know, kind of thing. So I, I don't, I don't really, I don't really know. And as much as we talk to our insurance people and, you know, um, they they don't they don't they don't seem to have a really good uh, a good answer for it either. I, I you know Mike Mike Edelman might have a better sense um, uh, when you when you talk to him, but um, I don't I don't really have a good answer for why insurance um, you know is so high. Okay. I mean, I would just throw out there that the federal government and the president did just make statements about um, why they're focusing on global warming because they are seeing insurance prices across the globe increase as a result of. Um, anticipated impact of global warming, um, and specifically even like China talking about um, seeing something, uh, you know, double digit percent uh, impact of global warming on, you know, just their insurance costs. And so there is a, I mean, I think mm -hmm. there is a lot going on in the world other than what happens in the housing stock that I think often is impacted by um, just 
how we're impacting the world and like seeing reactions to to the to that. Um, I would just be interested to. I don't know. I, I heard those numbers as, as earlier this morning. It was just a recent announcement. I think I, I would I, I want to read up a little bit more on why they're saying that globally. Um, and, you know, even China making a statement about, you, you know, being more focused on environmental justice and making sure to lower our carbon emissions because they they anticipate insurance costs being so high uh, due to the impact um, of global warming, both in heating. I mean, think about how long, you know, when it's colder, you heat more. When it's hotter, you use more electricity. Um, and it's just, there's there's impact that we're, I think, inevitably gonna have um, from that. Um, I just wonder how much impact it actually has on the housing stock um, in the country and New York City. Um, but it's something I think for us to just keep an eye on, on too. Uh, Christian. Yeah, so um, I, what share of your portfolio was nonprofit versus for profit? And have you observed the difference in NOI between uh, generally nonprofit and generally for profit? Um, no, uh, no, we haven't seen any discernible difference in NOI between between them. Um, and it's about it's about 50 50. It's not exactly 50 50, but it's about 50 50. All right, thanks. All right, so um, I, seeing no more questions, uh, I, I just want to say, Rafael, thank you. You know, I know you and your staff, this was not stuff that you had done for yourself. You had done this for us, and it, we're really, really grateful to get um, some insight into your large portfolio in, in New York City. It, it totally informs our, our discussions. Um, so thank you so much. We really appreciate happy, it. Happy, happy to do it. And, and, um, we did. We we wrote down the list of follow ups, and so we'll send some uh, some some additional information along um, uh, in the next uh, in the next few days. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. So we we had discussed taking a break. Um, we're running a little late. Can I make a suggestion, Andrew? Do you think we should just um, continue with Mike? And do you want to tell Lucy that we're running a little late in case she wants to jump on a little late? Does that make sense? And then we'll take a break after. Mike has been patiently with us for the last hour. So I was thinking maybe we would just stick with him. Does that all make sense to everybody? I, I just have a quick question. Are we, as a board, going to discuss the the last report that we heard or? Uh, we, we certainly can, you know, I mean. Uh, after the break or I just wanted to. I, I mean, could I, could I recommend that after our last speaker will stay on um, to the extent that we can, I certainly can stay on and continue this conversation and we can continue the conversation at our next meeting as well, um, for sure. Yeah, I, we are just on, some of these folks are on time uh, schedule and they're, they're now available. So I don't wanna have a, just, we can certainly do it at the end. I have Raphael's presentation, I can put it up if people have questions, so. So, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll turn, so I think we're all agreed. We'll turn to, to Mike. And then uh, we'll take a little quick break um, after Mike. Andrew, do you think that's workable for? Yeah, that's fine. That works. Okay, great. So um, uh, Mike Edelman is the group vice chair at m and Realty Capital Corporation. Uh, he and m and have uh, been, uh, you know, frequent, um, uh, a frequent assistance to the RGB, completing our mortgage survey, um, giving us advice, connecting us to people uh, that are, are good people to talk to. So we're, we're again also grateful to Mike for joining us and for the assistance he's provided to us over the, over the past years. Oh, my pleasure, David. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to talk with you today. I'll, I'll be somewhat brief just because I am under a little bit of a time crunch, but, um, and, um, you know, similar to what Raphael had mentioned, um, well, actually, let me back up. Uh, I've been doing mortgage lending in New York City for over 29 years um, at a couple of different banks. And then specifically, uh, M&T Realty Capital is the arm of M&T Bank that lends for both our portfolio as a portfolio lender, which holds the loans to maturity, and our um, uh, and what Raphael mentioned, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. We sell loans to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, I actually worked at Freddie Mac for 15 years, so. Have, have some good experience in that realm, um, uh, selling loans off to them. So, so 2020 was, was a rather interesting year. You had record low interest rates throughout the year. Um, and typically, you know, when rates are low, you anticipate, you know, significant demand for mortgage origination. Um, we've actually experienced a 40% reduction in loan origination in 2020. 
Um, we're starting to see a little bit of green shoots this year in terms of loan origination, but I'll, I'll get into that. And um, we do small buildings, large buildings, subsidized market rate, um, condos, co-ops. Uh, we do a fair amount of 70, 30 uh, bond transactions, new construction with 30% uh, um, set asides for area median income. So we, we kind of run the gamut of, of all types of properties in New York City. Um, so with rates being low, why did we have such a significant downturn in 2020? Um, a number of, of, of factors contributed to that. And I'll, I'll sort of just jump into a few of those and then I'll go through our portfolio. Um, we've seen occupancy go from 96.8% uh, in 2019 to 89.7%, basically 90%. So you're almost like seven percentage points down in occupancy. Obviously, lower occupancy contributes to a lower uh, income. Uh, underwriting collections, uh, and collections are, we use the term collections as a catch-all of how much cash is the borrower or our, our customer bringing in on a monthly basis. Um, we've seen that be reduced. Our range in our portfolio has gone from uh, 10 to 21 percent. It's an average of 15.8 percent reduction in underwriting collections. Um, one big point, which I know came up on with Raphael, which it, which I was going to mention, um, commercial income is a big part of that. Uh, we look at residential collections and commercial. Commercials down. You know, I don't have the exact number, but anecdotally, it's probably 50 percent lower. Um, you see the credit rated tenants, the banks, the Starbucks, the Dwayne Reeds, obviously paying. But a lot of the mom and pop shops are either uh, in uh, some sort of rental forbearance or they're just closed, unfortunately. So we've seen a 50 percent reduction across our portfolio in, in commercial income. And that obviously has an impact on operations. Mike, just to be clear, are you saying five zero or one five? Five zero. Five zero. Now, we, we tend not to have, um, you know, even though a store may be open, um, you know, typically what we've seen in some of the negotiations and we too, similar to Raphael, we offer forbearance to our lenders. We monitor on a quarterly basis, income and expense. Uh, we get rent rolls, we get income and expense. And when we see something that's going to raise our eyebrows, we have a conversation with them. We do offer forbearance. And in that process of offering forbearance, uh, we go through sort of what's happened on the residential side, what's happened on the commercial side. And it's, it is basically 50%. A lot of stores are still open, but are given six months, nine months free rent. So it's a, it's a pretty significant reduction. Um, and then uh, we too have also experienced an expense uptick. Uh, I know Raphael mentioned commercial income. Uh, I'm sorry, um, insurance. The insurance specifically, you know, historically there was a big uptick after Hurricane Sandy on flood and property, property casualty. We've seen the biggest uptick in the, um, what we call umbrella coverage. So it's liability. Um, owner's liability has gone up significantly. Why that is, I have no idea, but we've seen premiums go up. I had the number here, um, like 38% in just the liability portion. The property portion has really not gone up that much. For some reason, it's liability. And I, I don't know if it's COVID related. I'm not an insurance expert, but a 38% increase in one component of your insurance uh, has a pretty significant impact. So with all those headwinds, um, you know, obviously originations are down and, and and property sales are down. Uh, we had a 40% reduction in loan origination last year, and uh, we've seen sales down basically 50% uh, year over year, 2019 to 2020. So, uh, you know, a lot of headwinds, uh, sales are down. Um, in addition, with COVID coming into effect last year, we've instituted what we call a COVID debt service escrow. And basically what that is, is we're going to set aside, depending on the uh, the percent of loan to value, how high a risk a deal, anywhere from six to 12 months of debt service held in escrow, held in an account in the event that the borrower has some uh, disruption of income, uh, can't pay their, their, their mortgage, we have a pool of money there to, to draw on that. So that's been a big change uh, for borrowers basically to, to, to digest over the last year. Um, and we feel that that's, uh, that gives us a level of comfort to be still lending, but have some sort of a cushion in the event that, um, you know, we saw, you know, collections dropping over the year. And again, we're down, you know, almost 16% in terms of overall collections, a range from 10 to 21%, but 15.8% on average. Um, so 
you know, overall, our, our portfolio has uh, performed well. Uh, we do offer forbearance on existing loans. Uh, we do require that COVID escrow I mentioned on new loans. Um, and volumes are down on new origination. But our portfolio uh, has one deal that's in forbearance. We have uh, over 300 loans in New York City. Um, historically, on an average year, we'll originate anywhere from, you know, two to three billion dollars. Um, you know, we're down 40 percent. So um, that's that was like a little more than a billion dollars last year. Um, so down a lot. Thankfully, we've only had one loan in forbearance. Um, our forbearance program is we give a 90 day window where the borrower does not have to pay debt service. Uh, we monitor their rent rolls. We monitor their collections, their leasing activity during that 90 day period. Uh, after that 90 day period, they have to pay back one twelfth of the amount that they didn't pay over the next 12 months. So we recapture that. Uh, this specific property, which is in Manhattan, has been paying back. I think they're about 10 months into paying backs and we anticipate getting everything paid back. So, so the portfolio has, um, with all the headwinds in terms of reduction in uh, uh, occupancy down to about 89, 90%, collections down um, you know, 16%, um, and then um, just you know, the overall headwinds of, of the market in terms of expenses, uh, our portfolio has held up well. Um, and we're, we're, we're quite frankly proud of that. Um, Chris, and you asked a question a while back that is, 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 is a, I think, a very thoughtful question. I did want to address that. Um, so, you know, I think the question you asked for is when LTVs are down, um, why would LTVs go down if we're still lending? Why, why would there be adjustment in LTVs? LTV is one sort of just benchmark that we look at in terms of uh, our lending activity. It's a number that sort of gets produced. It's just the, the, the loan to the value of the property. That number has gone down because of one real reason. And the number one concern as a lender is not getting interest each month, but obviously that's important. The property performing is important, but the number one uh, requirement is that we get paid back at maturity. Uh, these loans have a portion of interest only or they amortize on a 30 year basis. So there's not a significant pay down of the mortgage for the most part. It's a borrower's option, but typically borrowers tend not to wanna to pay back uh, on an aggressive scale. Um, so what we do is we run what's called a refinance test. And a refinance test will take the income and we'll take the expenses and we'll grow it over the life of that mortgage. And the bottom line is, you know, we project rents out for those, that period of time, we project expenses out and we project interest rates. And if the borrower theoretically at the maturity of that loan had to go refinance that loan in the market based on those projections, are we able to get paid back? And so what we've seen in those projections is rents have come down, expenses have gone up. The outcropping of that is lower loan to values. So our lending parameters are becoming less because you know, for all intents and purposes and maybe not the right terminology, there's been a bearish bias against New York City uh, multifamily buildings. And therefore, you know, you're seeing an LTV number go down. It's not anyone's making a conscious decision to lend less. Um, it's the analysis on a refinance test that has impacted loan to values to be going negative. Um, so anyway, important to bear, bear message. So, you know, just in summary, you know, the portfolio's held up well. Um, we've had significant downturn in originations this year. We continue to monitor. We get data every three months in terms of a rent roll and income and expense. And we've seen collections reduce over that the last year to year and a half. Uh, the wild card now that's starting to happen in 2021 is we've seen an uptick in interest rates. Um, I think some of the stimulus and you know government debt has pushed rates up. 10-year treasuries, which we tie our mortgages to, have, have gone up. So uh, we're a little cautious with rates moving up this year. Uh, on how we could lend. Uh, that'll factor into that refinance test I mentioned about how aggressive we want to be on a lending perspective. But, um, but you know, we're, we're, we're back open for business. And I will say over the last two or three months, we've seen some, I'll call them green shoots in the market. I think over the last, you know, 13 months, you haven't seen, you know, offices haven't opened. Uh, you know, typically there's a big influx of people every year to move to New York that sort of buoys the whole market and, and you see rents go up. We lost that for 13 months. We're starting to see that to a certain extent. So we're seeing um, the collection numbers sort of trend back in the right direction. Again, we're still down you know, 15.8% uh, 
uh, over the last 13 months. But, you know, anecdotal information is that, you know, rents are starting to rebound a little bit. Um, you know, typically on rent stabilized units, it's that is sort of plays out in terms of what the net effect of rent, what kind of concession the, the borrower is giving to a tenant. And we've seen the concession number sort of be reduced slightly over the last, and that, that's probably a new thing. I would say it's probably since, you know, really March and April, the last couple of months. So we see a positive trend in that way, but historically, you know, a 16% reduction in collections has really impacted um, new activity. Um, and then, you know, the portfolio as well. But, uh, but for the most part, aside from the one loan in forbearance, we're still performing on a, on a 300, a uh, little over 300 property portfolio. So I'll stop there and open up for questions if anyone has any. Could, could you give us an overview of your portfolio, uh, you know, borough, building size, um, just, you know, how representative it is, you know, as we think about the, the entire city's of, uh, mm -hmm. housing stock? I don't have the exact numbers, but I, I could say sort of for the most part, we're kind of like the barbell approach, right? We have a lot of smaller buildings, uh, obviously rent stabilized in the boroughs. Um, I would say Manhattan is our number one. Brooklyn's our number two. Um, Queens is number three. And then the Bronx and Staten Island. So, you know, mostly Manhattan, Brooklyn uh, properties. On the small side, it ranges from um, when we do Freddie Mac loans, Freddie Mac has uh, taken an initiative to serve what they consider an underserved market. And when they determine what's an underserved market, it's it's buildings with less than 50 units. It's more of the sort of smaller owners. So uh, we have a fair amount of under 50 unit properties. Um, and then that's one end of the barbell. The other end of the barbell is the large sort of, you know, historically 80-20 bond transactions, now 70-30 uh, we have a, a, a sort of fair amount of those in sort of downtown Brooklyn, uh, a fair amount of those in Long Island City. Those are the new construction loans that we've done with, um, you know, New York State and New York City bond financing that we credit enhance the bonds and we're the construction lender. Um, and then we do those as permanent loans as well in, in terms of, the, of credit enhancing the bonds going forward. So it's really a barbell approach. You have sort of the, the large, you know, quote unquote luxury, albeit rent stabilized with set aside 30% set asides. And you have sort of the small portfolio. We don't have a lot in that middle mix of, um, you know, 200 unit properties that are, um, uh, you know, because there are quite frankly, more aggressive lenders in that market. We haven't been there. We haven't played there. We do the large construction and then the small sort of mom and pop buildings, if you will. Any other questions for Mike? Okay, uh, Mike. Thank thank you so much. Uh, again, it's it's so helpful to kind of hear about what's happening in the recent months. Uh, you know, since the pandemic started, it's it, it's uh, of great importance to our decision making. No, my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. So um, I think we are kind of uh, back on schedule. So again, thanks to Mike for that too. Why don't we take a is is um is a ten minute break? Does that make the make sense, or should we stick to five? Uh, Andrew, do you have an opinion on that? Let's stick to five because they usually goes to 10. Okay. All right. So everyone try, try to do five if you can. Uh, see, see everyone in five minutes. Uh, just make sure everyone, if they could turn off their mics and camera. Okay. Thanks.
So as people come back, if you could turn back on your cameras, uh, then we can reconvene. Okay, I think we're getting back. All right. Um, Cecilia is still, uh, her camera's off. Um, maybe we'll get started. Um, okay. So we have uh, joining us next, and with apologies for a little bit of, of delay, Assistant uh, HPD Assistant Commis Commissioner Lucy Jaffe, I believe joined by um, uh, her colleague, uh, Liz Gormer, and uh, I will turn it over to Lucy. Great, thank you. Good morning, Chairman Reese and members of the Rent Guidelines Board. I am Lucy Jaffe, Assistant Commissioner for Housing Policy for the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. In this capacity, I oversee HPD's research and evaluation team, which conducts the New York City Housing and Vacancy Survey. I am proud to say that despite the immense challenges facing our NYC HVS team and the city this past year, the team is currently in the field throughout the five boroughs gathering comprehensive data to understand our city's current housing conditions and the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on New Yorkers. New York City has been at the epicenter of the pandemic, but we are also going to be at the forefront of the recovery. Secure housing is critical to the health and safety of all New Yorkers, which has become even clearer over the past year. We remain focused on providing relief to the many tenants, homeowners, and small building owners who are suffering as a result of this crisis. During the past year, as the pandemic and closely connected housing challenges have unfolded, we have continued to work to ensure the city recovers fairly and equitably. Creating and preserving affordable housing, supporting owners in maintaining safe, high quality housing, and strengthening renter protections and keeping tenants in their homes will remain top priorities for HPD. As requested by the board, I'll now discuss HPD's work over the past year regarding these crucial issues. Creating and preserving affordable housing. HPD, working in tandem with the New York City Housing Development Corporation, financed the preservation of 22,070 and the new construction of 7,453 affordable homes in calendar year 2020. We are working in all five boroughs with 21,000 units in the Bronx, 4,000 units in Brooklyn, 2,500 units in Manhattan, 1,700 units in Queens, and 200 units in Staten Island. The majority of these, nearly 60%, serve very low income households or, or households earning less than 50% of HUD income limits, which for a family of three is equivalent to about $51,000 per year. Since the city has been ahead of schedule with over 177,000 homes financed to date, we remain confident that we can meet our goal of creating or preserving 300,000 affordable homes by 2026. It is more important than ever that New Yorkers gain access to affordable housing as quickly as possible. In 2020, the city marketed nearly 10,000 units across more than 300 projects on Housing Connect, our online affordable housing lottery portal. Housing Connect 2.0 launched in July 2020, which entirely revamped the affordable housing lottery and created far greater transparency, efficiency, and accessibility for the process. In order to make affordable housing lotteries more accessible to more people, HPD further expanded the Housing Ambassadors Program. There are now 48 Housing Ambassadors, nonprofit partners who assist New Yorkers with the application process. Assistance from ambassadors is available in 20 languages, and there are three organizations that specialize in serving applicants with disabilities. Some ambassadors also have access to separate interpretation services, which allow them to serve people in over 200 languages. Under this administration, HPD and HDC have instituted numerous changes to speed up the process of finding and securing affordable housing and to place more homeless families into apartments that we're currently leasing up. As part of the city's effort to house New Yorkers in a broad range of housing, the city had recently augmented City FAHEP's rental assistance program in early 2020, right before the outbreak of COVID-19. HPD seized on this new tool during COVID-19 to ramp up efforts to move homeless families into apartments that were currently leasing up. The agency worked with its affordable housing partners to dedicate a portion of the apartments, in addition to any existing homeless set aside, either in or entering the marketing process to homeless families and are grateful, 
grateful for the overwhelmingly positive reception. And we coordinated with HRA and DSS to further streamline the homeless placement process to move families in as quickly and efficiently as possible by streamlining inspections and reducing paperwork, for example. Supporting owners and maintaining safe, high quality housing. Another top priority is to ensure that owners maintain housing that is safe and high quality for all tenants. Through our preservation and tax incentives work, HPD assists building owners in making quality, safety, and environmental efficiency improvements. The city's home fix program provides funding, technical assistance, and counseling to owners of one to four family homes struggling to make needed repairs and otherwise maintain their homes. And as part of Lead Free NYC, the city launched multiple ad campaigns to inform property owners of the grants and resources HPD offers to support lead remediation and has published eight different webinars on lead-based paint topics, including record keeping requirements and HPD violations. Sometimes HPD must take enforcement actions against owners who do not comply with their obligations. Every day, and despite the pandemic, hundreds of HPD inspectors visit homes across the city and issue violations to building owners not in compliance. In fiscal year 2020, HPD closed 104,225 emergency heat and hot water complaints and issued 9,838 heat and hot water violations. HPD also issued 22,950 violations for mold, 9,619 violations for either positive or presumed lead bait based paint conditions. When necessary, HPD can charge owners for repairs, utilities, and fuel through the emergency repair program. In fiscal year 2020, ERP charged owners in more than 7,470 buildings. The 250 most distressed multiple dwellings are designated for participation in the alternative enforcement program each year based on the seriousness of the housing maintenance code violations and the amount of emergency repair charges incurred as a result of the work HPD performs. Round 13 buildings were selected on January 31st, 2021. These 250 buildings have more than 41,900 violations and they owe more than $3.3 million in municipal arrears. HPD's Housing Litigation Division also brings cases in housing court against owners who do not fix outstanding violations and when necessary, seeks findings of contempt and incarceration of recalcitrant owners. The city is also committed to eliminating tenant harassment. HPD's Anti-Harassment Unit brings claims against owners in housing court for maintenance-related harassment. As of January 31st, 2021, 1,498 building-wide inspections were completed in 887 buildings. Of these, AHU has referred 65 buildings for litigation and filed petitions in housing court based on harassment claims in 35. The City Tenant Harassment Task Force a joint effort by HPD, the Department of Buildings, Department of Mental Health and Mental Hygiene, the, the Fire Department, and New York State Homes and Community Renewal has attempted to inspect over 790 buildings, 14,952 units as of January 31st, 2021. Through 2020, HPD issued over 48,500 violations to these buildings, and 113 of them have ongoing cases in housing court. The city is also using data to identify buildings at risk of harassment, such as through the Certification of No Harassment pilot program launched in September 2018. As of April 2021, the city accepted 55 applications for a certification of no harassment, 20 were granted, 13 were withdrawn, one was denied, and the remaining 21 are pending. HPD also works with the Mayor's Office to protect tenants to be as comprehensive as possible in our efforts to protect tenants. The city has joined with other member cities of the High Cost Cities Housing Forum to advocate for federal resources to support tenants, homeowners, and building owners across the five boroughs and the country. Thankfully, in December 2020 and March 2021, the federal government allocated significant resources to assist low and moderate income renters and homeowners to prevent eviction and foreclosure, which will also support building owners who have lost significant rental revenue strengthening renter protections and keeping tenants in their homes. Although we will not have data from the current NYC HVS until early 2022, data from the 2017 NYC HVS show the challenges that renters already faced prior to the pandemic. Housing data in New York City have shown a net rental vacancy rate of less than 5%, which constitutes a state of housing emergency as defined by state law, since the NYC HVS was first conducted in 1965. In 2017, the vacancy rate was 3.63%. The housing shortage is most acute among lower cost units where we see even lower vacancy rates. 
Units renting for $1,000 to $1,500 per month had a vacancy rate of only 2.5% in 2017. In 2017, the typical renter paid 30% of their income toward housing, a rate that has been increasing over time. More than half of renter-occupied households were considered rent burdened because they paid more than a third of their income toward rental costs, and one third of renter-occupied households were severely rent burdened, meaning they paid more than half of their income toward housing. High rent burden is most acute for low-income households earning up to 80% of HUD income limits, which was $68,000, $68,700 for a family of three in 2017. These pre-pandemic conditions placed tenants at risk in various ways that likely exacerbated the disparate impact of COVID-19 on our most vulnerable communities. It is imperative that we use every tool available to stabilize and move toward recovery, addressing not only the immediate impacts of the pandemic, but also the ongoing challenges New Yorkers face in finding and retaining affordable housing. The rent stabilized stock overwhelmingly serves these low and moderate income New Yorkers. It continues to be a critical source of low cost, lower cost housing and provides invaluable tenant protections to many of the households hit hardest by the pandemic and at greatest risk of housing instability. 86% of those in rent stabilized units in New York City, more than 830,000 households fall within the income served by HPD in our affordable housing programs. This past year, because of the protections instituted during the pandemic, the number of New Yorkers who were evicted from their homes decreased tremendously, and the number of New Yorkers staying in shelter dropped as well. The city also worked to keep New Yorkers impacted by COVID-19 in their homes through initiatives like Project Parachute and our new Landlord-Tenant Mediation Project, which works to resolve disputes outside of housing court and keep vulnerable New Yorkers in their homes. The city is now working closely with the state to ensure that New Yorkers who need assistance to transition successfully out of this emergency period will receive the federal funds for which they are eligible, including through the upcoming rental arrears program the New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance will administer. The city is currently organizing a substantial outreach and technical assistance campaign to ensure that New Yorkers are aware of the program and receive help with their applications if needed. Looking forward, Finally, as you all know, HPD conducts the NYC HVS about every three years, most recently completed in 2017. The NYC HVS provides invaluable information on the city's housing stock and its residents, specifically with regard to rent stabilized units. Data from the NYC HVS are public and used by researchers, policymakers, and housing stakeholders to inform the conversation around housing issues in the city. This year, HPD is conduct conducting the NYC HVS again. The survey has been re redesigned for the first time since 1991 and has a newly added module of questions about how the pandemic and related government supports have impacted tenants, including physical health, changes in income and employment, and financial hardship, such as food insecurity and housing instability, since March 2020. The 2021 NYC HVS also marks a shift from a paper-based survey to a computer-assisted personal interview format, and it includes added resources dedicated to accessibility for those that speak a language other than English, New Yorkers with disabilities, and more. The results will provide invaluable valuable insight into the city's housing stock and its residents, and it will serve as a critical tool for understanding the impacts of the pandemic and planning for a fair and equitable recovery. Field work is currently underway, covering all major housing types and populations in the city. Thank you for this opportunity to update you on HPD's programming and the city's response to the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on housing affordability and stability. We look forward to further collaboration with this board and are available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, questions from the board? Do you, uh, Lucy, do you mind sharing your remarks uh, with Andrew so that we can get a copy of it? Because you went through a lot of numbers and I just want to be able to dig deeper into them. Actually, okay. um, I should have mentioned this beforehand, but I had sent her a testimony around. <laughs> <laughs> it came during the break, so like Shayla, you didn't miss it. Like just yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I I I should have jumped in. You know, I almost jumped in <laughs> while she was talking to let you guys know that. But the testimony has been sent around. Sorry, sorry about, about that. that. And there certainly are a lot of numbers, and we appreciate uh, everyone wanting to dig in. We we uh, Lucy, we had asked the previous um, speakers to to read the tea leaves. Um, any sense of uh, you know how the the new um, support coming from Albany is going to impact the city's housing market um, over the next year? Have you kind of run the numbers on that at all, or 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 given any thought to that? So 
we recognize that New Yorkers across the city, whether they're tenants, um, small building owners, homeowners have been impacted significantly, but also differently. There are a number of different federal uh, streams of support that are gonna be coming and we're gonna be working closely with our state partners and wanna make sure that um, everyone who is eligible knows about the program, uh, understands their rights, um, can apply easily and efficiently. Um, so we do believe that the significant amount of assistance, and I, I spoke last year here, I believe about the fact that how critical getting federal assistance was going to be for the city. So this is a significant development, of course, to have gotten um, these funds in December and in March. Um, but the as we move towards recovery, obviously meeting the the needs and and of the the variety of circumstances that New Yorkers are finding themselves in is going to be really critical. We also, as I, I, I can't talk about uh, the NYC HVS enough and how important that data will be in helping us understand um, this crisis and what New Yorkers have been through. And so we really do look forward um, to, to getting more of that information and being able to use it to build uh, our housing uh, programs and to support uh, New Yorkers across the city uh, moving forward. Thank you. Other other questions for Lucy? Uh, well, you mentioned uh, overseeing like the analysis, the data of, 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 of HPD. And I just wonder, um, similarly to um, uh, David's question, but also the questions of what we were seeing from other speakers. Um, CPC mentioned uh, uh, occupancy and collection being about the same, but obviously keeping a watchful eye. Um, Michael um, Edelman from m and Realty said that the portfolio has held up well, given what we've all been through. What are you seeing um, across the portfolio uh, and the support that HPD is providing? Are you seeing the same thing? Is there something that we should, that you would like to highlight um, on whether, uh, you know, buildings are staying whole or are, are, or are struggling? So I think the first thing that I'll say is that over the course of the pandemic, we, like everyone else, have been looking at all of this really carefully. And it's been difficult to predict, right? Certainly where we were a year ago when I testified is a lot different than where we are now and the, the path that we see towards recovery. Um, we uh, rely on the NYC HVS and the fact that it is a representative, really the only representative sample to tell us the full extent of what New Yorkers are going through. Um, specific to, to tenants in our portfolio and buildings in our portfolio, we've been working really hard across, um, you know, for the for the whole year to use whatever resources are at our disposal disposal to support buildings and make sure that they could um, adequately serve their tenants during this time. So we that's been uh, a lot of. Um, that's been a lot of work and it's, but it's something that we, we do feel pretty good about with the combination of the assistance to come and what we've been able to do over the course of the year. Uh, yeah, Christian, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just as a follow-up to, uh, to what Sheila asked, um, do you see any red flags in terms of not so much the HVS data, because we know that that has a significant lag, but I mean, you know, sort of financial data. I mean, it's like any other information that's much more current about your portfolio. Um, and as specifically as relates to stabilized units and others, I mean, are you seeing any sort of red flags over the past year that you think might be resolved through stimulus and also that you think might not be resolved through stimulus? You, know, um, you comment on those? So, you know, I think I hear the question being both citywide and specific to our portfolio, right? I mean, the city, we have 2 million rental units uh, in the city that serve more than two and a half million New Yorkers. And one of the things that we're very mindful of is the wide range of circumstances that any particular building, whether it's citywide or in our portfolio can be in. So there is no one size fits all approach for any of these buildings. And we, we are, going to need to use the, that sort of flexibility of that approach to assist buildings. We recognize that in reviewing the totality of the data in front of you, you're going to make the best determination that you can. And HPD has a number of tools at its disposal to help buildings that are in outlier circumstances or outlier situations and might need a little extra help. And so whether it's through our preservation tools um, or any, you know, any other uh, ways that we can support buildings, we're here prepared to do that because there is no sort of one situation that, that buildings right now, or frankly, that tenants are finding themselves in. 
Are you seeing an increase uh, in those tools being used in the last year? Sorry, uh, I think there was a two people. I missed the beginning of your question. I didn't hear the second person. Sorry, is uh, no. cutting one off. <laughs> Someone want to jump in or no? Go ahead, Shayla. I'll go. I'll follow you. Okay. Um, have you seen an uptick in the in those tools as you just mentioned uh, for the outliers increase in the during the pandemic? I can't speak to whether or not there's been an increase in sort of the, the need or the demand. We've been um, able to keep up with the goals that we set for the year and even surpass them, um, including for uh, for our work across the board. So that's been, I think, significant. Um, yeah. Sorry, David, I had one more question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, do, what do you anticipate of the impact of the, you know, the rent relief program to, you know, I know that we won't get the 2.1 billion in New York City alone, but what do you think the impact of that money will be not just on people's ability to pay back to rent, but owners being able to maintain and, and continue to run their buildings as usual? Yeah, we think it's a critical component. Um, while we don't expect to get, uh, you know, the full two plus billion dollars here in New York City, we certainly anticipate that a, a significant chunk is going to go to New York City tenants and support New York City um, building owners, you know, through through that process. And so, really, what's very important, um, you know, particularly in a pandemic, um, getting the word out and making sure renters are aware, renters, owners um, are aware of the program, understand how it works, that people are able to apply um, uh, efficiently and timely. So those are the, you know, those are the critical, the features, and, and we're, we're really working uh, um, to make sure that we have a strong campaign to get the word out and to support people in submitting those applications to the extent they need it. I promise this is my last question, David. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, just because I feel like the occupancy that I, numbers I'm hearing right during the pandemic are a lot higher than we would traditionally see, given that some folks left the city uh, for whatever reason um, during the pandemic. Um, are, you mentioned the HES vacancy numbers. Are you currently seeing vacancies increase in the portfolio that you have? Um, and I, I'm asking that specifically because I'm just trying to figure out, you know, did we lose a lot of people and they're just vacant units or is it a financial decision that people are making on doubling up and tripling up if they have to because of the pandemic and not being able to afford? And we'll see that hopefully those units fill up. Um, and I'm just wondering, how are you all addressing that given that you, you know, are supporting so many <laughs> um, owners um, in, during a crisis? Um, are you seeing similar things? So the, uh, we don't, we're not currently um, uh, aware of major concerns around vacancy in, in our particular portfolio. Um, those are sort of, you know, uh, issues that can be resolved. Obviously, our housing is in quite high demand. Um, that's sort of a separate issue from how the HVS measures vacancy. Um, but, uh, and that's something that, you know, as we talked about and as you alluded to in your question, that we should have uh, more information on when we get the, the new data from the HVS early next year. But just so that I'm just getting you to give me more of a direct answer, maybe um, are, are, you're not seeing like massive vacancies across your portfolio that is concerning about the viability of those units, because your assumption is that you'll see them. They're in such high demand that you won't. We're not, we not concerned about the viability of our portfolio because of vacancy. We believe that the tools that we have in place will help us navigate. Um, Lucy, I, I think this is following up on Shayla and Chris, Christian's questions, um, but uh, CPC and um, and m and were talking about the, the metrics of forbearance and defaults as how they're measuring their portfolios. Do you have uh, similar metrics and, and what are they telling you? For our portfolio, yeah. So I'm um, I'm not the best person to speak to that. Um, I my expertise is really in uh, here talking about the the housing and vacancy survey and some of our policy initiatives. But I can certainly uh, have someone get back to you on that. Great, thank you so much. Any other questions for Lucy? While well, we are exactly on time, uh, Lucy, th thank you um, and and your colleagues for really always giving us such a good overview. Um, of what HPD is doing. Um, and uh, we look forward to speaking more with you. Great. Thank you to all of you. We'll be well, Matt, man. Um, 
All right. So, uh, Andrew, should we uh, keep moving? Yeah, sure. Sounds All right, good. so um, we're we're happy that um, Deputy Commissioner HCR Deputy Commissioner Woody Pascal is able to join us again. Um, he has has joined us uh, certainly for every year that I've been on the board, and we're always grateful for the insights he could provide us from uh, HCR. Good morning, again. My name is Woody Pascal, and I am the Deputy Commissioner at New York State Homes and Community Renewals Office of Rent Administration, also can, known can, as. Can you hear me? Yeah, can I jump in one second so sure. I don't make the same mistake as I did with Lucy? Mm -hmm. In that same email I sent around are the answers to the question that HCR provide us in a timely manner for this for this uh, presentation. So I just wanna make sure you guys have that and understand that. So I'm sorry, uh, go ahead, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Pascal. No problem, thanks, Andrew. <laughs> so let me tell you this, I, I wanna really begin by um, saying thank you to all of you for your continued willingness to serve uh, the people of this great city called New York. Our city greatly benefits from your selfish public servants such as yourselves and on behalf of HCR Commissioner and CEO, Ruth Ann Visnaskis and everyone at the agency, we wanna say applaud you and say thank you. Um, before I begin my brief remarks, um, please allow me to introduce to you some of my colleagues at ORA who continue to be vital to our operations, especially during this pandemic. Uh, Ms. Sherelle Bedard, who serves currently as my special counsel. Mr. John Lance, who is the Bureau Chief for the Stabilized Tenancy and Rent Review Bureau. James Farrar, counsel in the Star Bureau. April Gray Guterres, our Deputy Chief uh, of the Property Management Bureau and Guy Alba from our research and analysis unit and my senior advisor, uh, Michael Berrios, who works very closely with uh, all of the fantastic staffers at RGB. And I wanna thank him and all of them for their dedicated service. So I'd also like to take uh, a moment to pay my respects to those who have been impacted um, to COVID um, since last year. Uh, I want to thank all of our healthcare professionals, our essential workers who continue to provide a very important service during this crisis and continue to stand on the front lines as we try to overcome this very difficult period in our lives. So that being said, chairman, members of the board, I thank each of you for the opportunity to provide you with an update of recent activities at ORA and for allowing HCR to be part of the process leading to the promulgation of this year's guidelines for rent stabilized apartments. As you know, we are all, we are all living through a very difficult time and the crisis surrounding COVID-19 pandemic has left no one untouched. No matter how extraordinary these challenges are, HCR's resolve has been strengthened and we continue to work towards making our city and our state more resilient. It's almost that that's why the Gov Governor Cuomo was fast moving establishing the eviction moratorium in March, 2020. And by executive order, he also allowed tenants to experiencing hardships to use security deposits as rent to eliminate uh, late fees on rent payments. The governor also signed the COVID-19 emergency Eviction Foreclosure Prevention Act, which helped prevent residential evictions, foreclosure proceedings, credit discrimination, negative credit reporting related to COVID-19. Further extended the senior citizens home exemption and disabled home homeowner exemption from 20 to 21. In terms of the day-to-day -day work at HCR, we have been fortunate that while COVID has caused us to slow down, it has not stopped us in our tracks. We are deeply aware of the economic aftershock COVID has, is going to trigger in our society and the devastation it has caused individuals and families. And since 1984, ORA's expertise has enabled us to support tenants and owners through many crises. And today is no different. We continue to inform tenants and owners about their rights and responsibilities under rent regulation 
And we have experienced, we have an experienced management team with all the necessary measures in place to keep ORA running without interruption, all while protecting the health and safety of our employees and their families. Now, I just wanna talk about a few of the ways that we've continued to operate without little interruption. We continue to work with our partners in government and community-based organizations to attend forums. ORA continues to work with tenants to provide them with rent histories. We continue to meet with tenants and owners by appointment only at our local rent offices. We have resumed processing of all case types and ORA has now converted 26 documents into what I call the top eight languages, including our lease writer, so tenants can better know and understand what their rights are. ORA has continued to work with New York City's Department of Housing Preservation and Development, Department of Buildings, Department of Finance, and New York City Housing Authority's Office of Section 8. All of this has been made possible by the dedicated staff that has been that has not only been fulfilling their roles at ORA, but has also been instrumental in H HCR's COVID relief, rent relief call center, assisting tenants and owners in their outreach. I wanna take a moment to thank them for their dedication and sacrifice. They are truly helping make a difference in the lives of vulnerable New Yorkers. We are confident that we will continue to make a positive contribution during this crisis and thanks to our dedicated employees, our relationships with interested parties and stakeholders. ORA remains strong in the current environment and our work is more important than ever before. As the global economy, state and local governments and our communities weather this storm, ORA will continue to be a strong partner that you can rely on. Now on behalf of Commissioner Visnaskis and HCR, I wish you success in your difficult deliberations and offer you ORA's continued support and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Woody. Uh, questions? I always ask this question, so I figured <laughs> I wouldn't stop this year. <laughs> um, how is the upgrade on technology going on your end? It is continued process. Um, it has been challenging again because of COVID and the slowdown. Um, we are very confident that uh, we'll have, hopefully bef before I retire, uh, <laughs> uh, a system that will uh, provide a better service to tenants, owners, and all interested parties. Woody, I, I haven't had a chance yet to take a close look at um, the responses to the questions. Mm -hmm. Anything jump out to you as a, as a change um, from previous years? Any any uh, high level uh, points you'd wanna make from, from those responses? No, not really. I think everything's basically uh, same standard stuff. Okay, okay. All right. I, wonder, I, wonder, I wondered if you had any insight on the rent relief program that you will, I hear, have some role in <laughs> that's uh, being rolled out that you can uh, share with us. Actually, I don't. I'm very fortunate that my office was, besides the fact that a few of my staffers were helping with the call center and helping with what I call the initial processing of applications, um, ORA was not involved in uh, the call center. And now that it's transitioning to the Office of Temporary Disability Assistance, I think that um, the outreach is going to be different. And um, I think the requirements are going to clearly be very different. I think the way that uh, the original legislation was drafted made it difficult for tenants to be able to access and to get the assistance that they needed. Can I have oh, one? I, I, I haven't been able to go through the questions. I was trying to scroll, but did you see an uptake of um, distressed buildings or applications for um, restructuring rents uh, in the last year that was uh, higher or different than the years before? Um, we have received a total of three applications for rent hardships. Um, it is a very difficult process and literally they're in the, what I call infancy stage. Um, I've been here now 
11 years. And on average, we may get one application per year. Uh, three of them doesn't jump out as being extraordinary, but again, the process is very difficult and long. Um, uh, are you seeing any trends with MCIs given the changes uh, uh, brought about by the 2019 law? Kind of, are you seeing the trend line go in a particular direction or anything interesting about MCIs? I'm gonna ask April to kind of talk about that, but um, I would say that uh, the processing of MCIs has become a little bit more challenging um, because of the, the, the code violation aspect of it. But April, I'm gonna let you kind of chime in there. I think it's also the addition of the reasonable cost experience. I'm not sure, am I getting an echo on you guys? Yeah, it's okay, yeah. we can hear you, but there's an echo. Is that better? Yes. <laughs> uh, I had to kill off the second speaker. Um, it's a combination of both the reasonable cost schedule and the number of owners that may be attempting to get waivers from that. We are processing. The number of actual applications is down a little bit. Um, and that, you know, we can account for it numerous ways. It could be COVID. It could be the fact that before HESPA came into place, a lot of owners tried to get their applications in very quickly under the wire. Um, and the change requiring how we look at the actual processing, including the fact that we're, you know, checking for violations where we've added an an additional um, layer of inspections where, you know, we're verifying the audit that we were already doing. So it's a little slower and there's probably a little less applications. There's a little bit of a catch up required for us to get the process based on the changes that were made in the law. But other than that, no, it's, you know, it's a little slower. That's about the best I could actually comment on it at this point. Thank you. Uh, on, on page, you'll notice on page five of their responses is the, um, you know, they, they respond to some of the MCI questions that we had. Um, and they can, there you have the total amount applied by owners in 2020 versus 2019 um, and how much was actually granted. Um, and, you know, so it's significantly down, but those are, you know, um, some of the things that were just mentioned may have had an impact on, on that, but it's significantly down from 2019. So I just wanted to point that. Thank you. And do you guys believe, I mean, I, I just wanna be clear that, that the intention of the law was to decrease MCIs, correct? Um, and to, well, that's what yeah. the advocates were trying to accomplish by repealing MCIs was to, eventually not have them be so readily available and increasing rents for tenants at the rate they were. I guess in that regard, I'll pass that back to Woody for a response. <laughs> Thank you, April. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, clearly we recognize that the change in the law is what it is. I think that um, you still want owners to invest in their buildings and to protect uh, the tenants and to ensure that the buildings have some of what I call new installations, whether it's boilers to make sure that our air is cleaner, whether it's green roofs to ensure again that the building uh, can absorb heat and, and that kind of stuff. And, and I think um, we, we get it, but again, we, our jobs are to administer the law as it's written. Uh, any other questions for Woody and his colleagues? Woody, uh, thank you so much, and thanks to Anytime. your team. Be um, well, be safe. Yeah, and you've you've kept us on schedule, so we're ecstatic. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll have some time for discussion at this point. Thank you. Be well. Be safe. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we're going to turn it over uh, to um, to kind of general discussion. I, I know Leah had just said that 
maybe we want to talk about some of the staff reports. We, we could talk about, you know, obviously anything relating to our mandate, anything we've heard today. But Leah, do you want to start? Sure, sure. You know, I think one of the, for me, uh, we often get into this discussion a little bit later. And so I thought that it would be helpful uh, that we talk about it a bit before the preliminary vote. Um, one, of the, one, one of the main sticking points that we deal with every year is, you know, um, small buildings, right? Um, and when we are coming to a decision and um, as a board, uh, oftentimes when some of us are balancing, you know, the interests of tenants versus the interests of landlords, uh, this idea of like, well, what about small landlords always comes up. And what I thought, you know, and I'd like to have a discussion about this, what I thought was interesting uh, is, you know, we, we have this big decision which impacts millions of New Yorkers. And obviously we all know that there are at least 1 million stabilized apartments. Um, but the, the, the thing that we're clinging to and the study that we're clinging to isn't, is something that we should at least take with a grain of salt. I don't think, and this is my proposal to everyone here. I don't think that we should make it as big as we have been making it for, 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 for all of this time. So for example, um, we know that there are at least 1 million rent stabilized apartments. Um, the study that we heard today is, you know, 99 projects with uh, 3,801 units, right? Those are actual units in the apartments. Um, and juxtapose that obviously with, we're talking about 1 million. The, the group said that it wasn't a scientific study. And of those 99, uh, projects that we're looking at to make our determination, it wasn't clear how many of those, you know, units are, how many of those are even small that we're looking at. And then small, it wasn't clear how many of those small buildings had rent stabilized units. So for example, one of the questions that we got into is if a building has 10 overall apartments, something that we're labeling a small building can have only one rent stabilized unit and nine um, private apartments that aren't rent stabilized. And we're looking at that to make a determination. Um, thing is, you know, the, the, these 99 projects, they are of self-selection, right? This is at least what I heard. They are, you know, uh, uh, I think the term that I heard was uh, the ones that respond back to us, right? So that's self-selection and those are going to be um, property owners really have something to say and particularly are bothered by what's going on. And for me, I think, I thought that it was something worthy of a discussion because every year, um, obviously there's a whole, there's a gap in the, in, in, in like the question of how many small buildings are in New York City and, and how much are small landlords hurting. But I don't want us to use the little information that we have and to expand on that, like as if it's this big, you know, huge scientific study when it's not. So I, 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 um, I would love to have a discussion about it and, and see what you all think, but that was things, um, because I know that we had a huge discussion about this last year as well in the midst of, um, of, of, of the pandemic. I mean, I think at the end of the day, we, we my point is very big decision to make that impacts millions of New Yorkers. And there has been a lot of talk um, and arguments that we need to use raw data, data, the facts. And if part of why we're not going to, for example, um, grant a rent freeze or something a little bit more progressive than that, like a rent rollback is because of this idea um, that any small hurting, if we're gonna rely on that, um, then it has to be something more than uh, 99 or less than 99, which is not scientific. So I wanted to put that out. Any comment? I'm much open 
often have, you know, it's important to have because we have discussion at offline, you know, pretty much every year. And, um, you know, I, I think it's an important discussion to have because I know that we're probably going to have it again. Um, and um, sure, so I saw Christian's hand up. I'll, I'll mute myself now, well, for a second. So along those lines, I wanted to ask, I mean, this is something that um, that I'm also interested in. I mean, it's like just how much of an impact are our decisions having on small landlords to what it, what of the data that we have for the whole market, what can be disaggregated by building size? Well, the, the income and expense study does 11 to 19 units and uh, 11 units or more. Um, we did send around a memo that looked at uh, buildings with 10 or fewer units make up, I think about 10% of the units that are stabilized are in those buildings. Um, but in terms of income and expense data, you know, that what we have that is part of the, you know, RPIE filings and whatnot, it's 11 or more, and that's from calendar year 2019. So, to get specific O&M costs from those and, and incomes from those, that smaller group, we don't, we don't have, have that. The price index gathered, you know, includes everybody. It's, it doesn't matter the building size. Um, that's an overall look on, you know, but it is a price index. It's not a collection of expenses that we gather from owners, but it's a price index. But for example, in the real estate tax bills, the taxes are in there for those buildings, you know, so, you know, we do include that in the price index. So that index would be reflected for the entire building um, stock that are, you know, that have stabilized, you know, stabilized units in them. Yeah, I, I would respond to Leah um, as follows. Um, I didn't take the CPC information or the M&T information about being information about buildings of a certain size. To me, what's interesting about hearing from the two of them was um, because most of, or much of our data and our income expense data in particular is from 2019, here were two relatively large portfolios giving us a sense of two important characteristics. One would be vacancies and, one, and the other would be collections. Um, and, and so for me, I think my takeaway is gonna be um, if uh, vacancies were very high, that would be a big cause of concern, or if collections were were dramatically lower than in the past, that would be a cause of concern. So that that's the data that those two presentations uh, um, uh, uh, that I valued the most from those two presentations. Yeah, and the point that I'm making is that we do and have certainly had discussions every year when as a board, we are balancing the interests of tenants and landlords and when we are talking about landlords, the sticking point has been consistently, um, the question always is, well, what about small landlords? Aren't small, small landlords particularly hurting? Um, and so if our decision, for example, to have a lower rent adjustment than the previous year, um, if we make that decision, how is that going to disproportionately affect small landlords? So that's really been something that has come up um, every year that I've been on the board, um, and, and perhaps Sheila can talk about me before that, but, but the last couple of years, it's been a question, and not just any question, but a sticking question um, that tends to really have a very, um, you know, a, 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 certainly a large factor in the decision making. So I, I thought that it was helpful for us to discuss, you know, and at least tease out and analyze, well, what exactly are we looking at to make this determination? Because it's, it, e even if we have very information, um, we also have to be of the little information that we've been not extrapolating it and making it, you know, this sort of crisis of, you know, this is one example to have a higher rent increase than we would because, um, of this sort of idea. This is a larger uh, part of New York City 
that we actually might not know and that the information that we're looking at doesn't necessarily show that and it isn't, you know, and I'm quoting here, isn't science. I mean, I think the only thing I would say is that like the things that I took off from both those presentations were actually that occupancy and collections are the same from Raphael. Um, NOI is not different between nonprofit and for-profit <laughs> landlords. Um, and then the same with portfolio has held up pretty well given what we've gone through. And so I think that that just tells us that even in the middle of a year long crisis uh, where folks have been uh, unable to pay rent, mortgages, uh, maybe people have struggled to pay, pay back their mortgages, even in a year like that, um, but the housing stock has held up pretty well. And I feel like that shows us that in spite of rent freezes in, in past years um, and then last year's adjustments that we're not seeing uh, the sky falling, uh, but we're seeing maybe signs that we can continue, we should continue to monitor as a board as we move through it. Um, but even the, I mean, the data from the reports um, and the date and the data that was testified to just today um, by our presenters sort of give me a view that the city is doing pretty well. Um, the housing stock is pretty sound um, and that, you know, the influx of the funding of the rent relief program is only going to support and make it better. Hopefully we don't know what will happen, but that, that the signs look good. Um, and so I feel like that, um, juxtaposed next to, um, compared to the struggle of like what's happening for folks who, um, are living in the city, um, and are living in these units, uh, is very different. Um, and that that development, even if folks are finding jobs, I don't know if folks were, <laughs> I have a lot of folks who are, were uh, jobless in my family, people that I work with um, in, the, in, the, in the organizing work that CASA does. Um, and what we're seeing is that the low wage workers are having a harder time getting jobs that pay them what they were making before. And so given all of those, that data, um, I, I still, I'm, I mean, I, I, I feel like what we did last year is the minimum start point for this year, um, in my uh, view. Um, and I and given that, I would love to have a discussion, and maybe not this year, hearing, um, in, in future hearings about like where do people see that being different and why, um, and what data are we looking at and basing that decision on? Not what we think will happen, but what is actually happening now because we are lagged a little bit um, by data. I see Christina and then Alex. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the challenges we have as a board is always that we have one tool that is kind of like a baseball bat when you need sort of a scalpel, right? Because we're talking about, we've got the small landlords, we've got the large landlords, we've got people who really are um, suffering from all the high costs. And then there's others who do live in rent stabilized who potentially because of their income could afford more. And we're sort of all over the place with like, that. we really have this one, tool that we're voting on about this this thing that as Leah said Leah said impacts a million apartments um, which are, are the wide swath. I think um, what I did hear though actually was a little different than what Shayla heard in the the CPC's report which is that the smaller buildings do seem to have more of a delinquency for whatever reason and there is a difference um, in so overall I guess you know it does average out to being the same, but that there are these differences depending on the size of the building for whatever reason. So that did stand out to me. Um, and I think the other thing though, is that it sounds like from the reports, like costs are going up. And I think it's just a question of, we have to balance those costs going up for the landlord against the rent that's being collected. Um, and, and those are just some of the thoughts that I've been having. Like, I don't have any it's sorry it's these are just the things that are running through my head of how as we approach this season you know and i think you know it's like the the data we have for the expenses correct me if i'm wrong andrew but that sounded more up to date because that's sort of like the last years whereas the reports we heard last week were still sort of pre-covid so it's like we're comparing two sets of information that are from different periods but that really relate to one another and i think that's also another one of our where our challenges come from that we need to be aware of yeah, the, the, price, the price index is reflective of, uh, you know, 
changes in costs and prices from that 12 month period from from April of last year to March of this year. Yeah. Alex? Hi, I, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Hi, so I, a few, few comments. Um, I guess I'm not quite as sanguine as Shayla may be. I, th I think it's a, really a mixed picture. I, I think that the income and expense report was really interesting. It showed that you know, the bottom did not fall out by any means. Uh, in terms of the operations, NOI held steady, even though uh, MCI increases were eliminated and the vacancy increases were eliminated. And I think it shows that most landlords did just fine after this, even though it's a transit, the data covers a transitional period. As far as the um, information, the more current information we have, it's a really mixed picture that there are some buildings that are clearly in distress. It's not you know, the, the majority, but there were, you know, significant percentage um, that both of the presenters referred to, even though it's not a random sample, it is a significant amount. And it makes sense given, you know, the, the hardship the city is going through. I guess another point is that it's really uneven, the impact and this relates to the work that my colleague at the News School, Jim, James Parrott, has done in that people that work remotely are doing just fine. Uh, people who are considered essential workers and for the most part have not lost jobs, have been able to maintain income. But people that are uh, working in you know, hospitality and other industries require face-to-face -face contact have been decimated in terms of job loss. And so where they happen to live, I think, affects a lot of the finances, you know, of the buildings. And the other point is the timing, you know, dear after the summer, until the, uh, the, until December, there was much less support. And now we have more support. So hopefully the finances of the buildings will improve. Uh, but there was this period of several months where people were really down on their heels, where the income was lost and there was not such public as government assistance. So it's, it's very complicated, but I don't, I think it's, you know, it depends on what time period that we're talking about and what neighborhood I think we're talking about that, that will indicate we, where the uh, properties are in distress. I guess my final remark would be that I'm somewhat skeptical about building size as being so key because a lot of small buildings may be in larger properties uh, in, in, you know, in uh, portfolios. And, if, and it's really the, the unit of analysis is really the uh, property, not the building. And so uh, I'm somewhat skeptical just at looking at building size. Anyway, those are my thoughts. I, I did want to um, just uh, just into put it into perspective for me. I feel like if we are if if landlords right now and what we heard was a little bit about vacancies being a concern, what will happen if two hundred and twenty thousand people get evicted? Given that they are behind on rent, I feel like that just makes the crisis like a lot like is going to balloon. I, I'm hoping that all of that back rent will be covered by the $2.1 billion in rent relief that we hope will come. But I, 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 I do have concerns about what, it, what is that landscape? We don't know. The courts are not fully open. Um, May 1st is just around the corner, but we're also fighting for an extension to that moratorium right now, uh, recognizing that, you know, we still haven't been able to figure out how to make sure that people like are people being served correctly like there's just so many pieces of just that big number um of what we're seeing just in in new york city so i i just want to make sure that we're not like we're not talking about the cost of food for tenants um or the cost of their medical expenses right now um and the cost of like staying home um and alex bringing i, I think it's a really good point of like the people at the bottom at the jobs of like the hospitality business that like that's going to take longer and who are the folks who work um and, and where do they live um based on their income you you would project that most of those folks are work we're housing them in rent stabilized housing um and you know the tech industry and the folks who are able to work from home those tend to be a lot higher income folks um and so i feel like that gives us for me that gives me a point of view of of, uh, actually anxiety of what's going to happen to people's tenancy um, and 
you know, people's ability to afford to live in the city and what will the city look like if we actually lose that bottom portion of folks who make the city run. Um, one, one other point I wanted to make, I just saw that I think it was Demos just came up with this um, um, dashboard which shows uh, the extent of rent arrears uh, nationally and it has it by county. And I'll share the link. It just came out the other day. It's based on the census pulse survey, but I think it may be a useful um, data point. Leah, did I see a, a kind of a hand? I, I'll just quickly say, you know, I, I won't name any other cities, um, but in terms of property and investment, New York City is still one of the major places to really where you buy property, whether it be, um, you know, a house or whatever. And um, most certainly in comparison to other cities in the U.S., will likely see a return on that investment. And so, you, you know, I, I, think, I think again, when we are making a decision and as part of that, we're balancing the scales, um, you know, we, we, we need to be mindful of the fact that uh, at the end of the day, there is no crisis there's no purport there's there's like a false narrative between profits and like people's survival and there's no actual crisis um here with with landlords not we're talking we're specifically talking about the the crisis is specifically um can there be much more profits the following year than it was this year um and if we look at things we're not in other cities in the US where there might be a real question of whether you can really make a return on your investment. Um, New York City everywhere is really rapidly changing. Uh, we have astronomical rents that uh, for anywhere really, you know, the prices of a one and two bedroom are the prices of a mortgage um, in a lot of other places in the US. So, it, you know, I, I, I do appreciate that we're having this conversation and we are analyzing really the data and what we're actually relying on. Um, and, you know, relying on what, what we're actually relying on, whether it actually makes sense, what those actual factors are going in for the studies that we're actually relying on and for what we know. So I appreciate that we're having this conversation. Cecilia, I wasn't sure if I saw a hand uh, from you as well. I just want to check in. No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Um, I, I guess my only two cents, and I think I'm kind of coming in where Christina and, and Alex are as well, which is that I guess I see it a little bit more mixed. Um, and, and I think that Shayla is right that CPC, that shows that their data that they have is showing that. So I, I'm mostly worried about collections. I, th I think vacancies is not a, an issue as far as I could tell. Um, so that collections with CPC seem to be doing just a you know a, a tad worse, but then what what M and T said and and again as as Leah has said this is not representative of the whole housing stock, um, but that their collections went down I think he said from like roughly ninety seven percent to ninety percent that's a big jump and 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 you know if at some point collections are so low that you know landlords can't pay their mortgages that's what would worry me you know that in other words that then the housing itself is a, is is a, is a threat. But then on the other hand, and this is consistent with what um, Shayla said, you know, that both M&T and CPC seem to say that their portfolios were stable, that there weren't that many in forbearance, there weren't that many on a default watch list. Um, so, you know, that that's good. So, I, but that puts me where I think Christina and Alex are, which is, you know, the data isn't like, it's great. I, the data is, there are some, some worrisome signs, but they don't seem to push things you know, in, into, I think, a level of crisis that many of us thought we might have found ourselves in when we were having this conversation a year ago. And, and I just want to hone in on my point to make sure that it's clear before we leave. My point is data that we're looking at is 99 projects, all of which are not small buildings. And so we cannot take 99 buildings or less and, and then make a statement and say, oh, well, this is what's happening with landlords in New York City. When we have 1 million rent stabilized apartments, 
Um, it's just, and, and, and then of the 99, it's not a scientific study. So that's my point of just us being cautious by, by accepting the reports. But I would say like, in all fairness that we should not make, um, not take the reports and then, you know, use those to then characterize like landlords in New York City, right? Because they're, they're, they're less than 99 in a study. Um, and then we're talking about 1 million rent stabilized, you know, apartments. And I believe the New York City Department of whether it was taxation or finance had about like in 2017, 80,000 residential buildings. So um, that's, that's, that, that, that's just my point. Uh, you know, just to just for us to be cautious of not, you know, making making this the available data that we have much more um, important and weighty than it actually is. A point point well taken, at least by me. I mean, I think the other thing I would. Uh, uh... I think our mandate is to simulate a fair market um, for a, a fair housing market, um, which we know it doesn't exist in New York. And so with that, um, I, I would be interested, and I don't know if the staff can help us do this, but um, to hear uh, our comparison to other cities, right? Like what are other seeing, cities seeing? Um, and I think that the point of Leo's earlier point of the fact that tenants in New York City pay higher rents than other cities, actually to me signals that maybe if if the if if the impact of covid is long term that there there is going to have to be adjustments made across everyone's budget because the impact is the impact we can't run away from it that's just the reality um and for me i i consider like i've how many families i've heard have been doubling up and tripling up that means three households people who had the kids who had their own apartments coming back to their parents, that's more cost for the landlords, except for that they're not collecting more rent. And so I, I, I start to see like um, affordability as an hindrance for our recovery as well. Um, and I, and I want to put that center as we talk about what, what we think will happen. Um, we are seeing that there will be more money rolled out for, for tenants to pay back rent, which means that landlords hopefully will recruit a lot of the funds that they, even in the data that we saw today, will look different. Um, and so I, I think that those things make me feel like the market, to David's point, we should continue to watch, but we're not in a point to be saying that we're in any, you know, uh, space where it's it's not looking good um, versus like, we just need to wait and see because we've never been this in this position, it's unprecedented. Um, and so I, I, that's the stuff I'm centering, uh, right, while remembering that, you know, we're housing folks who uh, are making under $50,000 a year and the most marginalized people across the city um, in rent stabilized housing and that we are trying to stimulate a fair market rate of uh, a market and in other cities, those tenants would be able to negotiate their rents uh, and would be able to negotiate, um, you know, their, their, uh, you know, ability to move uh, and, and their ability to move is a lot uh, bigger than in New York, because even in the middle of the crisis, we're still seeing uh, vacancies stay about the same across, you know, even HPD's portfolio, um, thinking about uh, Raphael mentioned vacancies were up, but not um, in, in, in a rate that is alarming to him. Uh, I think MNT is a little different um, because of the kind of lender they are. <laughs> um, and they might be taking a little bit more risk of assumptions of what they thought would happen in a normal year and that didn't happen. And so we're seeing the impact of that. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I just wanna remind us that we, we were in the middle of a crisis before COVID and now we're in a bigger crisis um, of housing. Um, and that, that, that's the lens that I'm coming uh, and looking at the data from to make sure that we can house people and then make sure that the housing stock stays um, uh, healthy and safe for people who live in it. Um, and right now I don't see any evidence that I'm like, oh, this is glaring, you know, buildings are gonna go into disrepair if we aren't, if we don't do something right now. Um, I'm not seeing that by the data, but I am seeing, we're gonna see mass evictions 
We're going to continue to see tenants figure out how to pay that back rent. Um, we're seeing uh, um, cases in civil court come more, be used more readily. Um, uh, and, and, and I'm, you know, anticipating the impact of that and not, and that not being great for, you know, the people who live in the city. Any, any last comments? This is obviously just the first round of, an, of, of our ongoing conversation. Um, any last comments for today? All right, well, th thank you all. And, uh, you know, I, as always, like, I, I'm just so grateful that we're really having that conversation at this really high level of, uh, of you know, just really thinking, thinking it from all angles. So I think it's a really valuable conversation to help us get to a final decision um, by, by the time of the final vote. Um, I will uh, ask for a motion to adjourn and then I will ask for a second. So Andrew doesn't get mad at me if I forget the second. <laughs> so motion. All right, uh, mo oh. moved by uh, Alex and, second. and seconded by Cecilia. Oh wait, I'm sorry, Leah. Do I you did mo motion seconded <laughs> and I just wanted to thank you for your statement in the beginning of, um, of the board deliberations. Thank you. All right, so, so thank you, Leah. And we are adjourned and I'll see you all soon.